Hi, I'm Jenna. Welcome back to Down to Earth and to Vancouver, Canada. This week I spoke with Alejandro de Avila. Alejandro is the founding director of Oaxaca's Ethno Botanical Garden. He is also the curator and directly responsible for the textile museum there. This conversation was historically significant. It honestly provides a time capsule and a look at just how Oaxaca came to be the city that it is today. And I am so excited to share this with you. This interview is really long. I just felt like I couldn't cut anything. Alejandro is so wise and he shared so many fascinating stories about Oaxaca, its biodiversity, the culture there, and the story behind the story of the Ethnobotanical Garden and the Textile Museum. I just loved spending time with Alejandro and I know you will too. Uh, how are you doing this morning? Did you did you start your day with the hot chocolate like you told me yesterday? Yes, of course. Every day. <laughs> okay, can you explain that to me? <laughs> Is it, how does one drink hot chocolate like it's coffee? <laughs> you don't use milk. Okay. You boil water and once you bring it to a boil, you take it out of the stove. Once you put in the chocolate, it should not boil because then it will toast the flavor. Okay. So you want the water to be really, really hot, but you don't want to boil the chocolate. So you take it out of the stove and then you put in the quantity that you like personally. I like it thick. There's a saying in Mexico, las cuentas claras y el chocolate espeso. <laughs> chocolate should be thick. And so I, make my own, I make my own chocolate. You can... You can get chocolate already made in different qualities, but I like to make my own. So I go to the place that I consider the best in Oaxaca and they have different grades of cacao. I, ch I choose the grade that I like, the proportion of sugar that I like. I cut down on the traditional amount of cinnamon, which is for my taste too much. And we use Sri Lanka cinnamon, which is different from the Indonesian cinnamon. In North America and Canada and the United States, you prefer the Indonesian cinnamon, but that is too strongly flavored for us. So we use the Sri Lanka cinnamon, which was a finer flavor. Still, I cut down on the amount, and I also cut down on the amount of sugar. I like it less sweet. So uh, I have prepared previously the little balls of chocolate of my recipe. Uh, they're hard and so you put in I put in a couple of the little balls into the water that has boiled and you let it sit for a while for the chocolate to start melting and then with a molinillo you develop a thick froth and then you drink it okay I have more questions so sure. you have like a pantry in your kitchen where you just have like a shelf that's filled with little chocolate balls I actually keep it in the freezer to preserve the freshness of the flavor. Uh -huh. So in my freezer, I have usually like six kilos of chocolate over to prepare <laughs> because I'm a chocolate fiend. I have it every day, as I say. Instead of coffee, that's how I start my day. When did this habit of yours start? It's not exclusive to my family. It's a Oaxaca tradition. Coffee came much later here. And a colleague of ours has traced back the history of chocolate because chocolate you read in the literature that it's a pre-columbian thing that's baloney chocolate as we know it began in the colonial period and it was in antigua guatemala where chocolate was first thought of now that doesn't mean they weren't using the cacao seeds for beverages in pre-columbian times but they were not preparing it like we know chocolate today. In other words, it didn't have sugar, it didn't have cinnamon, it didn't have almonds. And those beverages are still with us. And that's another uh, addiction of mine. <laughs> the most elaborate one that I know of in Mexico is Tejate, which is exclusive to the Valley of Oaxaca. Have you tried Tejate? Did you try Tejate while we were here? Tell it me about it, it doesn't look very appetizing. It looks like murky dishwater, but it's amazing. It is just incredible beverage. It has maize, but it's maize not treated with limestone, which is the way you prepare tortillas. It's not nistamal. 
it's called, it has a different term for it. It's called conesle. Conesle means, uh, the, the meaning of the word involves ashes because that's in fact how they prepare it. It's maize boiled with oak ashes. Then they wash out the lye very well. They grind it and then separately they grind the seed of the mamey. Have you tried mamey? Yes. Uh -huh. The seed is fragrant and oily. It is dried, toasted, ground together with cacao beans and a blossom, which is the logo of our garden. The blossom has an extraordinary depth of fragrance. You are the founding director of the Ethno Botanical Garden in Oaxaca. It's an incredible, incredible place. Um, and, you know, as we know with many incredible places, <laughs> there's oftentimes an incredible backstory. And I'm wondering if you can share with me the story of how the garden came to be. I would just love to know what the story behind the story is for how you started a botanical garden, because that's, you know, it's, it's a, it seems like it's quite an endeavor. <laughs> it's quite a story, Jenna. For our purposes, I think we should start with the political context in which the garden was proposed. This was a garrison. You may have heard when you came to Oaxaca that two thirds of the grounds of the Dominican monastery were run by the army. And it was military infrastructure here until January 1st, 1994. Why were the soldiers here? The soldiers were here since Benito Juarez, the first and only indigenous president of Mexico who was from Oaxaca, separated church from state. A major achievement that I wish would happen elsewhere, like the United States, but that's a side comment. He managed to effectively separate the power and the political sway that the church had from civil affairs. And in doing that, he nationalized church property because the church, the Catholic church, was the wealthiest landowner and economically the most important institution in Mexico. So all church property was nationalized in Mexico in the mid 1800s. And the Dominicans who had here in Oaxaca their main establishment in Southern Mexico, in not just in terms of a beautiful church and a gorgeous monastery, but really a center of learning and of training. They had a fantastic library and they were training young monks to become conversant in the languages and the cultures of this part of the world. Santo Domingo was always crucial in the history of Oaxaca. Since uh, the Dominicans first arrived here a few years after Mexico City fell to Hernán Cortés. This was Dominican <coughs> area. There had been uh, three religious orders coming to Mexico. First, the Franciscans, they established themselves in Central Mexico. Then the Augustinians who come and they get allotted areas in Western and Eastern Mexico, some areas in Central Mexico. The Dominicans arrived later and they established themselves in Southern Mexico. And Oaxaca was always the core for the Dominican establishment. So Santo Domingo was crucial. But since the mid 1800s, this had been army. The army coveted Santo Domingo because the Dominicans had invested heavily into building a huge monastery with very strong walls. They had realized this is geologically very unstable. A previous monastery had almost fallen in an earthquake. So they went all out in building a fantastic structure which had military significance. It was strategic because it was so strongly built, built, whoever controlled Santo Domingo could shoot cannonballs and wipe out invading armies. And so the uh, monastery was always coveted by the military. And once Benito Juarez decreed the separation of church and state, the military came in and they ruled Santo Domingo, even the church was part of Santo Domingo. 
So it wasn't until 1993 that we managed, and I say we because I was part of that effort, to kick the soldiers out. And it was thanks to Francisco Toledo, our patron saint, and a very dear friend. He passed away September last year, we're still in mourning. He had the vision, he had the political clout, and he had the political finesse to put it on the national agenda. He did not request it, Jenna. He simply insinuated to the president of Mexico at that time, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, that perhaps it was time to relocate the garrison. Carlos Salinas de Gortari was at the time lobbying for NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. He was courting uh, public opinion to have the people of Mexico on his side for the signing of an agreement that was widely perceived not to be in Mexico's best interest by very critical people. So uh, Carlos Salinas de Gortari was actively courting the intelligentsia of Mexico, the intellectuals. The intellectuals of Mexico hold sway over public opinion in Mexico, more so perhaps than in the United States. I don't know about Canada. But here, artists, writers, musicians are important figures. They're highly regarded, they're respected. And Carlos Salinas was very keen on courting the artists and the salient artists in painting and sculpture and other material media are here in Oaxaca. Oaxaca has been the home of the foremost artists in Mexico, I would say, since Tamayo. There's a long chain of artists and Toledo was widely perceived, we're talking about the early 90s, as the most salient artist alive in Mexico. So Salinas was coming to Oaxaca frequently and having four opportunities with Francisco Toledo and other artists. And Francisco very shrewdly took advantage of that and suggested that perhaps it was time to remove the garrison. And Carlos Salinas de Gortari said, of course. And he gave the order for the garrison to be removed. That decision was taken in 1993. January 1st, 1994, the Zapatistas rise in arms in Chiapas, the neighboring state to the south. And we say, oh, oh, perhaps the soldiers won't leave. But Salinas honored his word, and the soldiers marched out of Santo Domingo on January 1st, 1994, just as the Zapatistas were uprising. In fact, many of the soldiers were sent to Chiapas. Now, how does the garden weave into this? political uh, narrative. In 1993, once Salinas had given indications that indeed the garrison would be removed, Francisco convened many of those of us working here in Oaxaca doing interesting things, from his point of view, salient figures in uh, activism in the city, uh, people involved in architectural conservation, but also people like me doing research. Ethnobotany is my thing, textiles is my thing. He convened us to form a non-governmental organization, which he gave the name PROWAX. PROWAX stands for Patronato Pro Defensa y Conservación del Patrimonio Cultural y Natural de Oaxaca, a long-winded name to say we are a group concerned about conserving the cultural and the natural legacy of Oaxaca. I was part of that group. I am one of the founders of that group. And within that group, we had long discussions. What are we going to do? And Francisco was not convinced. Francisco talked to me to the side and he said, what do you think, Alejandro? The artists of Oaxaca were enamored with the idea of using the ground level of the monastery 
once the soldiers would leave on the next, the following year. They were enamored with the idea of establishing a series of workshops to train students in engraving, metalworking, sculpture, paper making. There was not a good paper mill like there is today in Oaxaca. Oaxaca is now famous for the quality of its paper, but that is now made in San Agustin, at the outside of the city. At the time, there was no paper mill in San Agustin, and so the idea was to have it here and to have jewelry and to have textiles and all kinds of workshops for young artists to be trained in. And the idea was to use the grounds of the monastery, the open space around the monastery, what is today the garden, as an exhibit space for the sculptures, for the large works of art that could be shown outside, and to grow plants that would be used for the paper manufacture, for the high quality art paper. And Francisco said, what do you think? And I said, Francisco, it's not enough space to seriously grow plants producing cellulose. And we would sacrifice a unique opportunity that we have. In this space, we can create a garden that pulls the stories together. The story of the Dominicans in Oaxaca, why they decided Oaxaca would be their hub, the story, the larger story, the more interesting story for us of why is it that Oaxaca stands out in many respects. Oaxaca stands out first from the point of view of biodiversity. And I'll have more to say about it later, because if I delve into that, I am afraid I'm going to lose my thread. In addition to standing out for its biodiversity, Oaxaca stands out for its cultural diversity. There are more languages spoken here in an area about the size of Portugal or the state of Minnesota in the United States. That's about the equivalent of the size of Oaxaca. There are more languages spoken here than in any area of comparable size in the Americas. That is a statement that you can check. There is a web page that it keeps track of linguistic diversity, and I'll give you the link. There is no area in the Americas of comparable linguistic diversity, at least today. Today, we have reliable data. We, we can really project about the past. But for the languages that are alive today, Oaxaca stands out. And Oaxaca stands out when you look at foods, when you look at festivals, when you look at crafts, when you look at textiles, when you look at dye stuffs, when you look at fibers, when you look at cooking, when you look at everything. Why is it that Oaxaca is the area where cultural diversity explodes? I propose to Francisco, we can make the case through an ethnobotanical garden, not a regular botanical garden, but a specifically an ethnobotanical garden, that there are links between natural history and human experience. In other words, let's relate biodiversity with cultural diversity. And I prepared a paper, um, pre-proposal, I would say, for establishing an ethnobotanical garden in August of 1993, just as I was leaving to do my graduate work at Berkeley. But I presented this paper to Francisco, and I okay, was I have a question. Raising yes. my hand. Raising my yes. hand. Yes. Um, so you just kind of wrote it in a paper. You said, like, listen, we need to have this ethnobotanical garden, and you wrote a paper about it. What does one include in a paper like that? It's just like, so we'll have lots of great plants, people will come by and enjoy it. Like what was, you know, what I think is so, I mean, one of the many reasons why I'm really excited to talk to you right now is that you put pen to paper for something that is just out of this world, beautiful and amazing. And I'm just wondering like the, there's a strategy behind it. And this is kind of when you were putting together that strategy. So what, what, do, what do you write? I mean, you, you know, step one is I'd like, you know, I'd like to create this in a botanical garden. And then what, what was in that document? And can I, I can see share, it sometime? I can share the document with you. I have it on my computer 
from where I am talking to you. I will be glad to share it with you. It's not a very lengthy paper, but it took a lot of thinking. It took time to develop it. I wasn't just presenting the case for the garden. It was not my intention to preach to the converted. I wanted to show that it was feasible, that we had the means of doing this at different scales, depending on how successful we should be in raising funds for the project. And we had key people in Oaxaca who we could draw into the project, invite into the project as advisors, as collaborators. And I also reviewed the literature to make the case that Oaxaca was ripe for such a project. And it, although I wasn't thinking consciously of about it, Jenna, it turned out what I wrote had the weapons to, to say it metaphorically, to prevent alternative visions from gaining ground. Because at the National University in Mexico, UNAM, a colleague proposed to the federal authorities, well, this is a wonderful opportunity to do a garden on the Colombian exchange, which would be also a very interesting project. But living in Oaxaca, we said, no, for us, the Colombian exchange is not the project for this specific place. For this specific place, we would like to show what Oaxaca is about to visitors, for them to gain a yeah. sense of the fact that that cultural experience that they're living in, in the city and going through the museum is rooted in the landscape, in the mountains that you see around us here in the city. For those of us who don't really understand the term ethnobotanical, I'd love for you to break that down for us. So an ethnobotanical garden um, I, my understanding after you explaining it was that it's a, it's a botanical garden that is made specifically to reflect the lives and cultures of the people nearby. Is that about right? Or I'm, I'm just, what makes this a different type of botanical garden as to, let's say, another one in any other city? When I proposed the ethnobotanical garden, Jenna, I have to be frank to you. I thought I was innovating. I thought there was no other ethnobotanical garden. And I was very ignorant because there was already here in Mexico, but in the city of Cuernavaca, where I hadn't been in a very long time, already an ethnobotanical garden existed, but that was devoted and is still devoted to the medicinal plants. What is ethnobotany? Ethnobotany is a discipline that the name for it was coined in the late 1800s in the United States. And at the time, it was focused on documenting the indigenous knowledge of the native people of North America regarding plants. And it was a use focused discipline. What can we gain from the ways native people use plants? Very colonialistic in its root. Let's profit from what they know. Let's make use for medicine, for nutrition, for raw materials, for industry. That is the roots. Like many of our disciplines, it's rooted in politically uh, very questionable past. So you put together the paper. The paper has ironclad research in it. And then you just have a lot of different reasons for why this needs to exist as an ethnobotanical garden for the people of Oaxaca. You then deliver that paper, and I'm sure you also had a, a conversation with Francisco Toledo about the whole thing. I would love to know what he thought about the initial paper and kind of what your interaction with each other was before you set it further into motion. Francisco was an incredible person. He was a master. He had a spiritual depth like nobody else I have known. 
we didn't need to converse much. He saw through me. And I also had the sense that I knew part of what he was thinking. We did not waste much time in conversation. It wasn't necessary, Jenna. He would say a few, he would express a few thoughts, and I would catch what he was aiming for, and I would respond. And he was also sparse in his comments. He did not elaborate in his feedback, but I knew that what I had presented was what he had expected with some ideas that perhaps he hadn't foreseen, but he wasn't interested in the nitty gritty detail. He wanted the big vision. And with what I produced, he provided the seed money out of his own pocket to establish the following year. I, as I said, prepared this paper in August of 93. The following year, he set up a trust fund for establishing an ethnobotanical garden, what I had proposed. And he gave the money of his own pocket to draw in the most important financial institution, Banamex, through Fomento Social, an NGO that they fund. Uh, so we had funds from the private sector and we had state government funds and we had federal government funds. And that was wonderful, not only because we had a diversity of financial sources, but we had equilibrium. The government did not run the show because we had on the governing board of the Strauss Fund representatives from our NGO and from the private sector through Banamex. It was very good equilibrium, but that was the vision of Francisco. Then what happened? So the trust fund gets established in 1994. And at the same time, Carlos Salinas uh, gives instructions to the Minister of Social Development to uh, publish an agreement which has all the weight of the legal system because it is published in a periódico oficial, Diario Oficial de la Nación, which is the um, way that law, when it is, when the um, executive branch of government has the uh, authority to uh, uh, decree it, uh, when it doesn't have to go through the legislative uh, division of uh, the government, uh, it is published and it becomes a law into effect. So in, in 1994, the trust fund is established and at the same time, the grounds of Santo Domingo are removed from the Ministry of Defense. In other words, the military have to leave. And the, the agreement stipulates two things, that whatever is indoors in the building that was built by the monks goes to the National Institute of Anthropology and History, which is the arm of government, of federal government, that runs the cultural legacy of Mexico up to the 1800s. And whatever is outside and the building where I am sitting right now, which was built in 1903-1904, is allotted for administrative purposes to the state government. The property still belongs to the federal government, but it is run by the state government. And the agreement further stipulates that this is to become a garden, medicinal plant garden, Jardín de Herbolaria y Etnobotánica. But in effect, it was meant to be destined for the Ethnobotanical Garden. So that's our legal basis. And with those two, uh, uh, how would I say, with those two foundations, the legal foundation and the financial foundation, we could start uh, the project. Now, we had to wait. I was at Berkeley. Uh, 
from 1993 to 1997. But it worked out beautifully because we had to wait anyway because the entire grounds was devoted to the restoration project. What had been the garrison, uh, which included a large part of the Dominican monastery, was restored. It used to be covered by a huge concrete slab that was removed and domes were rebuilt. And the beautiful finishing of uh, the uh, limestone plaster, which is so attractive to visitors, was worked out, the fresco paintings restored, and it was converted into the beautiful museum that it is today. But that took a long time and we couldn't start the garden because they were using it as a brickyard. The restoration crew was using the grounds of the monastery as a brickyard for carving the stone, for bringing down the construction debris of the demolition of the concrete slab, et cetera, et cetera. And so we waited and waited. And gradually they vacated pieces of the property for us to start improving the soil because the soil was terrible. The soil had been compacted over centuries and it was very alkaline soil because the Dominicans had burnt limestone, they had made their own mortar here, and they had built the monastery and the entire grounds was loaded with limestone that we removed physically and then we planted uh, green manure crops in several cycles and we open up the soil, we, we worked it out. It was beautiful work, it was very physically exerting labor. Part of it we did with tractors, but a lot of it we did by hand. We had over a hundred uh, people working with us at one time. When we began, it was over a hundred of us. So uh, in the meantime, Francisco asked me, you are at Berkeley we need to start. Who do you recommend that we bring into the project? So I recommended a couple of persons. One couldn't do it, the other one got interested in the project, came down from Mexico City, started working, and but uh, they were waiting for me to, to come back. Uh, and as soon as I came back, I was named the director and I'm, I'm the director since. And we've been working uh, with a trust fund that was established by Francisco Toledo, we worked with that money uh, until 2006, and it was wonderful because the original investment, at that time, interest rates were high, and the original investment duplicated since we had to wait anyway, and that meant a sizable bag of money, which we could invest into collecting plants uh, from far away, getting very heavy plants, very large trees, as heavy as we could, to have something to show because we didn't want to have just seedlings and then have people come in 15 years. That wasn't the idea. We wanted to have something to show. So we brought in as large plants as we could. And the survival rate was high. We were so pleased because for many plants, we didn't know there were no, um, nobody had done it previously. Nobody had transplanted trays of this size in Mexico or elsewhere of those species. So there were no books to draw on. We, we, we were learning as we, as we went. A team from Michigan came and gave us a workshop. That was actually before I came back from Berkeley, but that was crucial in developing the skills to uh, transport trees and have them survive. We were very collective, Jen. We, we work with whoever got interested and wanted to help us and we invited them and we had wonderful advice from wonderful people. First of all, so smart, <laughs> such a smart approach. Second, that's the story of how the botanical garden started. Let's go back in time. I would love to know and to learn a little bit more about your specific um, focus areas and the research that you do. You've published over 80 pieces on traditional knowledge of plants and fungi, community conservation of nature, early biological documentation in Mexico, the history of textile arts in Mesoamerica. Like there's this whole other universe that we still have to talk about, right? Um, and now that we know the story of how the botanical garden came to be, I'd love to know a little bit more about what, you know, one of the key people behind it. Um, 
it'd be great to just learn a little bit about your life story here. <laughs> so um, I know that you were doing your PhD at Berkeley, right? Um, yeah. But before that, you got a master's degree in psychobiology. Uh, before that, a bachelor's degree in anthropology and physiological psychology, which also sounds fascinating, at Tulane uh, in, New in New Orleans. Um, you were born and raised in Mexico City, um, even though your family is from Oaxaca. So just would love to know a little bit more about your personal background um, so we can kind of piece piece it all together um, because one just doesn't start uh, at the botanical garden, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. I don't want to personalize the story too much. I don't want to talk too much about myself. I want to talk about the team that we are. But I do have to start out with myself. Just a little bit, like a brief overview, and then, and then I have other questions for you, don't worry. <laughs> I think the most crucial anecdote I, that I need to share with you is not about my schooling or about my publications, but how I first came to Santo Domingo. I was 11 years old when I first came to Santo Domingo. It wasn't open at the time. Santo Domingo was being restored in 1968 when I first saw Santo Domingo. It was close to the public, but my father was really passionate about Santo Domingo and wanted us, his children, <clears throat> I am the oldest of four, he wanted us to see Santo Domingo. I don't know how he did it, but he got us in. And it was wonderful because we were on our own. There was nobody watching over our shoulder. There were no guards, people saying, don't go in there. No, we had free range. And we explored and explored and walked up and climbed and went everywhere in the monastery. We couldn't go out of the monastery. We saw from the windows the garrison. The garrison was off limits. Nobody could go into the garrison. But I really got a sense of the place. And no other place that I remember from my childhood is like Santo Domingo. I can say that Santo Domingo spoke to me. That is the feeling that I have, that the place really communicated with me. I know that sounds touchy-feely, but that's how we feel. And it's a memory that is with me since that day. It was December of 1968. That moved me, and that's been with me since. Many years later, eh, when I came to live here in Oaxaca, after getting my master's degree and before enrolling in the PhD program, I volunteered to do work with the ethnographic collections at the museum. The museum was established long after my visit. The museum was established in the 70s. And the museum is an incredible space. It has extraordinary collections. People uh, are very keen to see the gold jewels of tomb number seven of Monte Alban, uh, which are very beautiful and very glittery but there's a lot more to see. And I was working specifically with the textiles, the textiles of the 19th and 20th century held in Santo Domingo. And I was visiting regularly the bowels of the monastery because I had access as a volunteer to the storage areas where nobody else went. So I had, again, an intimate experience of the monastery in those years. And over the years living in Oaxaca, I came to live here in 1984, I became part of a community of young biologists, but also some historians, some anthropologists, and people in other disciplines with a different outlook on what we should be doing, not just in Oaxaca, but in Mexico. We were antagonized. I was kicked out illegally of the academic job that I had gained because of my political activism, but that was part of our experience. And when Francisco Toledo came to Oaxaca, I was already here when he came back because he was in Europe. When he comes back to Oaxaca and establishes himself here in the city, previously he had lived in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, 
I didn't seek Francisco. I didn't go present myself to him. It was mutual friends who thought we should know each other. And when we did meet, it was love at first sight. It was so beautiful because we didn't, we didn't need to, to discuss. We didn't need to say, oh, we have such interest in common. It flowed so beautifully. It was such a significant encounter for me that solidified the outlook that we had developed as a group and we became part of the community of activists here in Oaxaca, challenging official projects that we felt were threatening the natural and the cultural legacy of Oaxaca. And not just Oaxaca, but beyond, beyond our city. We, we, we became involved in national issues. So it's in that context that we proposed the garden. And it wasn't just the garden. We, we proposed that the entire complex of Santo Domingo remain public in its entirety of free access and that it be devoted to cultural, a, a cultural, a, how would I say, that it, that it have a, as its mission, as its vocation, a, a cultural a, endeavors. Because at the time, we're talking of 1993, when the decision was taken to remove the garrison, the state government, and I have to say this, the state government at that time wanted to establish a luxury hotel, a convention center, and believe it or not, they had the project of a parking lot in what is today the garden. And we say, over our dead bodies, no way. And we prevailed. Oaxaca City as it's known today is like this amazing nexus of culture, and nature and identity. And it has this like really rich um, kind of civic life going on. And it, you know, the museums are incredible and the food's incredible. And it's just this, I just love, I love your home city. From 1968 to today, has it, has it kind of always been like that? Um, you know, or, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about the nature of the activities of the groups that you're a part of, because I do think that that you all are really directly responsible for just what we see when we're walking around Oaxaca today. When I came to live here in 1984, and my previous visits to Oaxaca, because I had spent a lot of time in Oaxaca since my childhood, since my father was from here. My father was born here. He, he his family then moved to where my uh, grandfather was from in San Luis Potosí, northeastern Mexico. My, my father was born here. And my grandmother, a Refugio, she, as a good Oaxacan, was a matron. She really ran the family with an iron fist. She was very much a Oaxaqueña. And throughout her life, Oaxaca was foremost. She instilled in us a love for Oaxaca. And through her, we learned to eat Oaxacan food, Oaxacan chocolate, Oaxacan music, Oaxacan customs. It was Oaxaca culture. She was staunchly Oaxaca. She longed to go back to Oaxaca throughout her life. So growing up, I had this very strong attachment to Oaxaca. And it is not unique to my family. Oaxacanos are very proud of their city, of their roots, their cultural legacy. And when I came here, and since, since I remember in my childhood, Oaxaca was always the most beautiful city for me, the most beautiful valley, the most beautiful mountains, the most, most interesting region, such lively markets, such just incredibly beautiful landscapes, I always thought. But it was a very different sense. When I recall how it was in the 60s, my earliest memories of Oaxaca in the 70s, when I spent a lot of time here, before uh, going to Tulane, uh, my grandmother's cousin, Ernesto, who was very important in my upbringing because he was sort of like my grandfather. Both of my uh, grandfathers had died, but Ernesto was like my grandfather because he took me under his wing. 
he was a very successful businessman in Mexico City, but again, very rooted in Oaxaca. He had a home here in Oaxaca. He had a gallery here in Oaxaca. He came here all the time. And he had established since the 1920s, Jenna, one of the first galleries in Mexico dealing with folk art and also colonial and pre-Columbian art while it was legal to deal with it. And he put together a fantastic collection of Mexican art, which he later uh, gave to me. And I donated to the museum in Santo Domingo. It's another link that I have with Santo Domingo and also with the textile museum. But this is to go back to your question of how it felt at that time. Those experience that, uh, experiences that I had in the 1960s and the 1970s when before, I was going to say, before I went to Tulane, my granduncle Ernesto sent me here. He had, in addition to the gallery, he had a weaving workshop where he produced tablecloths and placemats and napkins and uh, all kinds of goods, uh, yardage, uh, very good quality cotton hand woven. And, he wanted me to learn the process, not just the process of weaving. I learned to weave at his workshop, but how does such an enterprise come about and how is it run? As I say, he had me under his wing and I came here and I spent months and I loved it. That's when I really came to know Oaxaca. Uh, I spent a lot of time here, but it was a very different city. It was a beautiful city with very strong traditional cultural life, but the museums, were so primitive, if I may use that word. And there was very rudimentary intellectual life here. And the university was really backward. There were very few really opportunities for Oaxacan students to be trained here. They had to move to Mexico City or elsewhere. It was a very different city back then. And when I came to live here in 1984, I joined an institution that was established by the Instituto Politecnico Nacional, the second most important academic institution after UNAM in Mexico. It was devised with a very lofty ideal in mind of providing interdisciplinary research aimed for community development. That was a grandiose mission, which in effect, I feel has not succeeded. But I came here with that ideal in mind of joining a group of people really aiming to provide technical solutions and scientific research that would benefit local communities. But as I recall, life back then was very provincial. It wasn't what Oaxaca is today. The arrival of Francisco Toledo and other artists who came back to Oaxaca, who coalesced around Francisco, really made a huge difference. That's when things started happening in the cultural scene. And it's been in crescendo. I'm not the only one who has commented that for a city of its size, there's no place in Mexico, perhaps not in Latin America either, where you have such cultural activity to the point where we often are ahead of Mexico City in, in some fields. Exhibits come here before they go to Mexico City sometimes. Plays, music is performed here sometimes before. Dance is also active here, writers. Can you share a little bit about um, your work with textiles and specifically uh, the Textile Museum? Um, it's an incredible collection. Um, it's also a collection of many pieces that people in today's modern era have never ever seen before, ever even knew existed. Your, your curatorial team there, you've collected textile um, kind of these beautiful pieces of history from around the world. Um, I think that's also a very interesting choice um, to kind of internationalize the collection. And so I'd love to know a little bit more about your work with textiles. Again, the textile museum has roots that go deep in the past and deep 
in the ground. I'm ready for it. <laughs> Thank you. <Richard. laughs> Another story. <laughs> yes. Let me start this time with my personal story. Because I am very passionate about textiles. My great grandmothers on both sides of my family were weavers and spinners. I have spoken so far about my father's side of the family. My father's mother was from Oaxaca. My father's father was from San Luis Potosí, but I haven't spoken about my mother. My mother was, she died last year, of Finnish descent. My grandparents were Finnish. And in the family, we kept the spinning wheel of one of my great grandmothers and the memories of how they had spun wool, linen, and they had woven for the household. So I inherited that in my family. And from the San Luis Potosí branch of my family, which is my father's father, we know that not only did our great grandmother weave, but we have actual examples of what she made in the family. And she made very, very fine weaving. It was called by the family, La Feligrana. Not Filigrana, which is standard Spanish, but La Feligrana. To indicate how fine the quality of the workmanship was. Technically, it's called gauze, gauze weaving but it's a specific type of gauze that achieves patterns. And that was the specialty of Rita Rangel, my great grandmother. And I inherited from my, my Oaxacan grandmother gave me when I was 11 years old, the same year that I came to Oaxaca and where I have such vivid memories, that year when I turned 11 years old, my grandmother gave me a bag that belonged to my grandfather's brother who had died tragically because he was a very good horseman. And in a horse race, the horse had run amok and had thrown him against a newly installed telegraph pole. And that bag is what hooked me onto textiles. It's a beautiful bag. I will send you a photograph of that bag. It's double cloth, which is a very elaborate technique. Two layers of cloth are woven at the same time. We don't know who made it. My uh, relatives do not recall that my great-grandmother Rita wove that technique, but whoever it was who made it did a beautiful job. And that bag that my grandmother gave me made me not only appreciate the beauty of Mexican textiles, but it planted a seed of questioning in me because in that part of Mexico, it wasn't supposed to be that there would be weavings because they were not indigenous people. Weaving in Mexico has always been associated by anthropologists and by historians with the indigenous people, the people who have retained a Mesoamerican language, and a historical link to the populations of the pre-Columbian period. But in northeastern Mexico, where the de Avila family comes from, there are very few indigenous people and not in the area where my relatives came from. So the question was, how do I explain this? And it took me many years, and I eventually did research for my degree in Tulane. That was my honors thesis to provide a uh, historical explanation of how this came to be. But this bag hooked me into textiles. I became fascinated with the techniques of textiles. I became fascinated with the materials, the fibers, the dye stops, the plants used to produce color and to fix the color because one thing is to produce and the other one is to make it stay. And what the designs involve, where the designs come from, how they are created, how they're achieved in the various techniques, how you can oftentimes trace to what technique the, origin, the design originated in. There's multi-layered levels of approaching textiles. And I became a collector. I became an avid collector. I would save my allowance 
to buy text. <laughs> and my parents were very generous to me. They saw that I was serious about it and they helped me put together the collection. And I already mentioned that my granduncle, Ernesto Cervantes, he was a collector of everything. He collected old McJade and he collected estofados from Guatemala, beautiful wooden sculptures with gold leaf. And he collected ivory carvings that were coming from the Philippines on the Manila Galleon. And he collected everything of the pre-Columbian and the colonial area. But he was particularly devoted to textiles because he had the workshop producing the tablecloths. And during Second World War, he had shipped Jena weekly containers full of goods to the United States. During the Second World War, there was huge demand for housewares. They couldn't care less if they were made by hand. What they needed was cheap furniture and cheap sandals and cheap clothing and cheap tablecloths and jarich. And my granduncle was providing that. He made quite a bit of money dealing in that way. And he collected textiles avidly. And that textile collection, along with the rest of their collection, I inherited from him. And Francisco was also interested in textiles. He had lived in Teotitlan del Valle, which you may have visited. Teotitlan is the Zapotec village, where Zapotec language is still spoken, just a half an hour away east of here, of the city. And it's, it's an incredibly vibrant community doing fantastic quality work. Perhaps the best wool weaving in Latin America is produced in Teotitlan on a thread loom. I'm not talking about the Andean loom, which is very high quality in Bolivia and Peru. But for the thread loom, I do believe that the best quality is woven in Teotitlan. They are very skilled craftspeople. And uh, in Teotitlan, this uh, weaving tradition has uh, been uh, alive and has never uh, waned. And Francisco went there. Francisco went in the 1960s and spent time there. He was living in the town and he was working with weavers, their beautiful tapestries woven at that time with his designs. And Francisco got together with Trine. Trine is a Danish textile artist and they lived uh, for over 20 years together. And I met Trine the same moment that I met Francisco and developed just, a, just as deep a friendship with Trine and with their children, Sara, uh, who was already a little girl, and then uh, Benjamin, who was born a few years later, and we were very close. And Trine, of course, brought weaving into our everyday experience because she's a textile artist who does fantastic work. And so we started talking about a textile museum. We started talking about it in the 90s and it was an idea in the back of our minds and we explored various spaces where it could happen. We even lobbied the state government for the neighboring monastery, El Carmen Alto which is adjacent to Santo Domingo. And the governor uh, in the early, uh, the governor from 98 through 2004, saw this project with good eyes and he said, yes, let's do it. Let's, let's devote that monastery of El Carmen Alto to the textile museum. It didn't happen. For various reasons, it didn't happen, but the seed was planted right there. And luckily, for everybody, Marisabel Granien and Alfredo Harp, our patrons at the Texan Museum, got fascinated with the project. Marisabel is a historian trained in Seville. Her expertise are the engravings of the 16th century. She has written the definitive analysis of that aspect of the art history of Mexico, but she's also interested in textiles. And so 
they said, let's do it. And they did it. They provided the funds to acquire what had been the home of a wealthy cochineal merchant. I mean, it was destined to be Jenna, a beautiful- That is the house. most Oaxacan, like, Genesis story of a building of all time. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's a beautiful house. And they acquired the house. They, it was in ruins. They rebuilt it. And it's now the textile museum. And not only have they been incredibly generous in refurbishing that colonial building and turning it into a viable museum, but they have provided the funds. I have proposed to them, look, this looks like an interesting collection. They think about it, they ask me to justify it, and they say, okay, Alejandro, why don't you negotiate it? It's been wonderful that way because we have developed what I think is now the most balanced holdings, Jena, for Mesoamerica as a whole. It is not the largest collection. The National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City has by far the largest collection of Mexican textiles. It runs into the tens of thousands. They have incredible material from all over Mexico, but they don't cover Guatemala. The Museo Ischel in Guatemala has by far the most significant collection of Guatemalan textiles. But they don't have material from Mexico. They have a few pieces. But we have become interested in having a collection that is full geographical coverage and as much time depth as we can provide. We're not going to have pre-Columbian textiles because of the looting that is involved. So it's a philosophical issue with the Harp Foundation and with ourselves. We, 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 we see with, with, with pain how the incredibly beautiful pre-Columbian textiles of Peru and uh, the northern coast of Chile are brought to the international market and we say that's not right. We feel strongly that it's cultural that should go back to the country of origin especially in those cases where the national museums don't have pieces of that quality or specific cultural periods or specific uh, geographical areas. Mm -hmm. We feel very strongly that way. Uh, so, so we're not, we're not, we're not acquiring pre-Columbian textiles. That is not what we are interested in. But for the last 200 years, the 1800s, the 1900s, and the present, we are interested in having holdings that people can look at to gain a sense of what Mesoamerican textiles are about as a whole, not just Oaxaca, not just Mexico, but the entire region. And it's not aimed for scholars so much as it is for the weavers themselves. In Oaxaca, we are working with the cooperatives and the groups of weavers who are keeping this tradition alive, who are living from it. And we're working closely with them. And we have workshops and we show the Texas of Holdings of their communities. And now with the pandemic, we're even more geared towards really having a platform where this is available, where it can be looked at through the internet. So we talked about the botanical, ethnobotanical garden. We talked about the textile museum. Um, you shared a lot of really great anecdotes about growing up in kind of your field of study. I now have some societal questions. <laughs> so um, being someone who who is fascinated by textiles, that's, that's also an art form that is not as prevalent today in terms of fashion, in terms of how people dress themselves as it was earlier um, before the industrial revolution. And I'm curious, um, in your opinion, do you think, I mean, obviously in Oaxaca, it, it's, it's different because there are people, there are weavers guilds and, and, and artists just about everywhere you look. Um, but on, on a global level, um, I'd love to know what you think about 
kind of this battle for culture? Are we losing, you know, when, when we lose sense of like a sense of tradition, we're also losing a lot more um, certain techniques and certain art forms. And um, as someone who's been kind of a cultural and natural curator for so long, um, I'd love to know your thoughts on, on our current um, kind of, yeah, I don't know. Are we losing culture? <laughs> Yes and no, Jenna. I think Oaxaca is a showcase for what happens on a larger scale. It gets consensus here, but it's not unique. What do I mean by this? Totitlan weaving is alive and well. They're doing finer work than was done in the 1800s. We know that for a fact because we have sarapes that were woven in the 1800s in museums and you can compare, and today there's much finer weaving. And in the 1800s, some of the examples are dyes with synthetic dyes, and today a lot of the dyeing is with cochineal and with indigo and with other uh, traditional dye stuffs. But it's going to the market. It's not being used in the mountains of Oaxaca anymore. It is not being used even in Teotitlan. Rarely do they weave for themselves. They're weaving for the Santa Fe shops. They're weaving for people who are interested in having a rug in their home in France or in Canada or in Colombia. We do have members of the elite of other countries in Latin America who appreciate the craftsmanship and they say, oh, this is a beautiful rug. I want it for my hacienda or whatever. But it's not for self-consumption anymore. Self-consumption in the crafts continues to erode very little of the production. And I'm not just talking about textiles, but thinking of ceramics and thinking of stonework, the metates, for example. Rarely do people use the metate anymore. And the basketry, it's mostly going to the global market. And there is a growing niche or there was a growing niche before the pandemic for crafts. People appreciate. There is a mystique of what is done with the hands and it's back to the earth and it's the raw materials that nature gives us. It sells well, or it used to sell well. But the people who make it rarely use it. That is the fact. We see that here. Still today, weavers will wear some of what they use, but the children no longer. That is something that we see before our eyes. The younger generation is less and less willing to use the traditional garments, to wear what identifies them as indigenous people. And for good reason, because they're discriminated. Subtly, with subtlety, but no less pervasively in Mexico and elsewhere. So uh, can we generalize about what is happening on the global scale? On the global scale, before the pandemic, let's see what happens after the pandemic and the outcome, the economic fallout of the pandemic and the effect it will have on the tourist trade. Before that, there was the, the, the curve continued to rise in terms of diversifying craft production and appreciation. I can tell you from my own experience, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, it was very hard to find good quality crafts. Now, let's say 2019, you had very high standards in ceramics and textiles, in metalwork, in jewelry making, et cetera, et cetera. Much better stuff than what I used to see in the shops when I was growing up and a greater diversity. And perhaps most significantly, genetic techniques that had died out have become revived. And we at the Textile Museum have been part of that. We have analyzed from our own holdings particularly significant textiles. That's been one of my contributions. I've been fascinated. I'm, I'm technically inclined. I, I am fascinated by ingenious 
structures and textiles and I figured them out and I reproduce them and I, and I show people how to do it. I have been collaborating and I sent you an example uh, with uh, the work that we do with Noé Pinzon, a wonderful young weaver from San Mateo del Mar, and Icot, a fishing community. Uh, Noé has been working with me for the past five years and we are recreating lost techniques, including feather work. And we're doing beautiful work, if I may say so myself. But that's something that wasn't anybody, nobody was doing it before we started. And I'm not just speaking for what we do, but other uh, weavers and, and other researchers elsewhere have become interested in, and have stimulated the, the recreation of formats that were long gone. So that is happening, or that was happening before the pandemic. It's a mixed bag, I would say, Jenna. Some techniques have been revived. Quality has gone up. But how about the social use of those products? They're for the market. They're for the middle class and higher who has an education and a sensitivity to appreciate and to say, yes, I want to invest in buying that for my home. And they will pay $100 or more to purchase a beautiful piece of majolica or a wonderful textile that will accompany them in their apartment in Manhattan. But in the communities where they come from, less and less. Yeah. I hope this responds to your question. It's perfect. Um, and I have another question. <laughs> so. We can go on for hours, Jenna. Great, all right, awesome. Now, if you could just uh, pass me some of that hot chocolate through the, the <laughs> computer, that would be really great. Um, so it's something that I think is just so amazing about the work that you've done is that you've really dedicated yourself to a city and dedicated a lot of time to making that city a better place for other people. And you've also dedicated a lot of time to memory and to tradition and to honoring the past. And I just think that in order to create something new within a place, you also have to have a sense of what happened before and how it fits into that dialogue. And I'd love to know a little bit more about the thoughtful approach that you all took in creating these new Oaxacan institutions um, to make sure that they were responsive to the culture of the place and honoring the place. Because just, you know, um, in spending time there last summer, you know, walking around the textile museum, um, walking around the botanical garden, it's just so apparent that there is such a love for Oaxacan history and culture kind of just embedded within those places, right? It's just part of the DNA. Um, and I'd love to know a little bit more about your thoughtful approach. Like how did, how did you incorporate tradition and history into building these new kind of cultural mainstay? I mean, these, these, these museums are gonna be around, you know, very, for a very long time. Um, we hope, Jenna, we hope. It's always in Mexico, in Oaxaca particularly, in Latin America probably as a general, it's always a tight rope. It's always walking on a thin line and we don't know where the next batch of funding is going to come from, if there will be. And we hope and pray, but we're not sure. Things are very tentative always, very unsecure. How did we develop a social basis? Let me reflect back on something I had already said. The museums that were in existence that I recall in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were full of Oaxacan love as well, Jenna. That is not new. Oaxacan has always been proud of itself. Mexico has always been a very nationalistic country. It's part of us. We are self-conscious. We know that we are a cultural synthesis, and this goes back to the revolution of 1910 and even previously. Jose Vasconcelos, who you may have read about, the great educator of Mexico after the revolution of 1910, he wrote about 
the bronze race of Mexico being a cauldron of being a cultural synthesis of having not only roots in the indigenous people of Mesoamerica and the European invaders, but also in Africa, the people that were brought in chains across the Atlantic, because for the first 200 years of history after 1521, there were more African people brought here than European people arriving. The genetic contribution of Africa was larger in the first phase of the colonial period than the European component. And then we had the Manila Galleon. And with the Manila Galleon, there was trade with China through the Philippines, but also with Japan and with India. And there were people coming from Asia here. That is a fact. The historical records are full of indications. And now there's even in DNA analysis of graveyards of the heavy component of Asian people establishing here. Mexico City has been written about, and if you're interested, Charles Mann in his book, you probably know his book, 1491 and 1493. In the latter book, he portrays Mexico City as the first truly cosmopolitan metropolis in the sense of really being a synthesis of everything and the encounter the marketplace of everything, no? We are very aware of that. We are conscious of that and we're proud of it. And it's part of our cultural outlook, perhaps more than Peru, perhaps more than Brazil, perhaps more than Cuba. I don't want to compare, I don't want to, this is not the Olympics in culture, but Mexico has always st stood out. It was, after all, the new Spain, it was called. No? The empire saw it as a very significant outpost, not, not like others. And so Mexico, in its thinking, in its leaders, in its innovators, has always had that mystique behind it. The museums that were in existence in Oaxaca, when I when I came here for the first time, when I recall since I since my childhood, were focused on Oaxaca and the glorious past of Monte Alban and the Zapotec people and the Mystic people and the gold jewels and the beautiful ceramics, they were portrayed with high praise. But as I said, it was very unsophisticated discourse. We really saw a chain change with the coming of Francisco and others. It wasn't just Francisco, other people who, who decided to settle here, to, to work together here and to... With that, I don't think it was really something that was consciously formulated and, and said, let's do a, 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 let's turn Oaxaca into cultural utopia. No, it just <laughs> happened, no? It happened, yeah. it happened. It attracted more people and it created the scene that we see today. Now, I see your question as being broader in the sense of how do you involve the local people into a project like this? Even if it's not formulated, if it's not articulated in a message to be socialized. Francisco had a vision. Francisco, as I said, was a man of few words, but strong actions. And when he convened ProWax that I've already described, he invited everybody. He was open. It wasn't just, oh, let's invite this, but not let's exclude that person because, no, he opened it up. He was eclectic. And there were even people that did bad things, but they were brought, brought, brought in because it was to socialize it, to, to, to really show that we wanted to provide a forum where people could discuss and to have arguments and to to fight occasionally. In, in working in the garden, we did a lot of fighting. A lot of fighting, especially with somebody who's crucial to the garden, Luis Zárate, a very gifted artist. Most of the aesthetic decisions in developing the garden, we thanked to Luis. But Luis had a very different vision from hours and there was a lot of strife there was a lot of back and forth and his strong ego and i would entrench myself and it was francisco 
who had the final word, Francisco ironed things out smoothly. And it didn't have to be a long, convincing speech. It was just, he would provide a cru cru few crucial words that would resolve the issue. Francisco played that role, not just in the conflicts here at the garden, but in the conflicts that inevitably arose in our everyday work when it was pitting the self-interest of a family who wanted to modernize their building, their home, against the interest of the city in preserving and providing a crude example, but you get a sense of what these discussions were about. Because people who were part of, of ProWax were oftentimes <laughs> drawing the back towards us and, and saying in public that yes, they were all in favor of cultural legacy, but then privately doing horrible things to their property downtown. And we were saying, well, that's not congruent with what you're saying. I mean, you have to act the way you speak, no? ProWax provided that space so with it all its like a real with labor all its, of love <laughs> with, yeah a lot of love with all its contradictions a labor of love a lot of a lot of, uh, a lot of patience and tolerance tolerance because oftentimes it was contradictory it wasn't like he was supposed to be and yet in the end it worked in the end it worked most of the time it must be uh you know, very fresh still for you all, but it must be kind of hard to imagine that Francisco cannot play that role for future um, future debates, right? Um, and, and kind of helping to uh, to really kind of act as that patron saint of Oaxaca, right? I mean, it's it's got to be um, pretty tough these days not having him around anymore. I'm sad. I'm really sorry about that. I'm sad. I'm sad because we really miss him. We really yeah. listened. He was a friend. He was a presence that lighted things up always. And without him, we feel weak. His children are active. Sara, we look as somebody. She has a character. And she is trained in design. She spent time in New York. She's very bright. And we want to work with Sara. And we continue to work with Marisabel and Alfredo, who've done fantastic work, beautiful work. And we hope Oaxaca will continue to be a space that is unique in the sense of providing the opportunities for dialogue. It's the poorest, one of the poorest states in Mexico, perhaps the poorest. And you may have read that just the day before yesterday it was awarded the most visitable city in the world award. Did you read that? No, I didn't. Yes. That's uh -huh. exciting. Congratulations. It's this, it's this um, organization. It's an international organization that, uh, based on a member's feedback, rates uh, tourist attractions globally. And Oaxaca was rated by the people voting the most visitable city in the planet. Hmm. Yeah. It's, um, I can look up the article and send it to you because it came out in the media. Mm -hmm. It's an international organization. That's a reflection of the mystique of the city, the, the magic of the city. You, you said it very articulately at the beginning, Oaxaca stands out. It, you come here and uh, there's even if you the don't, water. there's something, <laughs> something happening, yeah. yeah. For sure. Uh, uh, the Oaxaca, uh, I would like to think it's it's the strategic location of Oaxaca in terms of biodiversity, and I still have my biodiversity spiel to, blurt, <laughs> to, blurt, to blurt out to you if you have the patience, and the, cultural, and the cultural scene that is so interesting. We are strategically located as the core of the region where agriculture developed. In fact, we have the earliest evidence for agriculture anywhere in the Americas, right here in the Valley of Oaxaca. The rock shelter of Gilanaquitz has provided the earliest archaeological evidence known so far, 10,000 year old squash seeds that were already being planted. There's nothing comparable of that antiquity anywhere else in the Americas so far. And we also have some of the earliest evidence for writing in the Americas, along with the Gulf Coast, uh, the Olmec evidence. Uh, and we have the earliest 
planned city in the Americas. We have early cities on the coast of Peru, but in terms of urban planning, where you see forethought for the orientation of buildings with regards to the landscape and with regards to astronomical uh, coordinates, uh, astronomical, uh, the, the rising of uh, Venus and the uh, equinox and the, <clears throat> you know what I mean, no? The, the, yeah, constellations. Not so much constellations, but the highlights of... Celestial movements. <laughs> uh, yes, and the, the furthest point of the, the sun in its yearly cycle and how that relates to agriculture, because these were practical observations. They had application in uh, running the production of maize, beans, and squash. So uh, Montalban is the first urban center, from what I have read, where there is planning before the first building is erected. So we have these cultural landmarks, earliest agriculture, some of the earliest are writing, perhaps the earliest writing, still debated, and the earliest planned city. Why in Oaxaca? Why this here in the Valley of Oaxaca and not in the Balsas Basin to the west or the Valley of Mexico, which is not a valley, it's also a closed basin or was a closed basin, or the peninsula of the Yucatan or the highlands of Guatemala. Why Oaxaca? Well, I think part of the magic of Oaxaca is the fact that, yes, we are the core of this region where agriculture develops. We are the core of what we call Mesoamerica, where writing was something featured widely, where calendrical observations were made regularly, where there was a shared system of uh, time, uh, keeping track of time record, uh, time record, and uh, other cultural uh, features that really pull the region together. A lot of also shared linguistic traits, and that's been something interesting to me because uh, my doctoral dissertation uh, was focused on how people name and classify plants. I started working with the mystic languages of Western Oaxaca, Eastern Guerrero, and Southern Puebla. But uh, I started becoming interested in going beyond the mystic languages and realizing there's regional features that are in common with other Mesoamerican people in, for example, marking, overtly marking, greens. Something that Caldwell Esselstyn would love, I think. Because green leafy vegetables get the same label so that you know this is something to be eaten as a green vegetable. And that's something that is shared beyond Oaxaca. It seems to have been innovated in Oaxaca, right? That's perhaps my own personal bias, but something that occurs more widely. So there are all these features that point to the fact that there's a shared cultural story here in this region. And Oaxaca is the center. Geographically, it's the center not where Mexico City is located, not where Guatemala City is located, not where Merida is located, but right here. We are the, ge the geographical center of this region that shared timekeeping and a writing system and a way of perceiving plants and other features. So that's one factor. But the other factor is the complexity of the landscape, Jena. This is a very rugged region, Oaxaca, is characterized as a crumpled up piece of paper. It's very, very rugged, very mountainous. And it's mountainous in a crucial location where you have the influx of both the Gulf, the Atlantic, and the Pacific. It's where the continent gets narrow. It doesn't happen further north. It's where it begins to happen. It goes on being narrow from here all the way to Panama. But it happens here first. You have the influence of the two oceans. That's crucial in the life histories of plants, animals, and fungi. And the location of Oaxaca explains the, partly why we have such great biodiversity. 
I think it's time for my biodiversity spiel. Would you mind, Jenna? I, I, think, I think it is too. I think okay. you can proceed. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. With that encouragement, I will. Unlike Peru, and I'm not looking down upon Peru in any way, or Brazil, or Colombia, or Ecuador. We no. should call Malena into this conversation exactly, right now. <laughs> exactly. And we should draw gloves, boxing gloves. No, just metaphorically. No, it, I want to generalize before I narrow down on Mexico and Oaxaca. If you look at the global patterns of biodiversity, there's something very interesting happening in China. The foremost areas of biodiversity are in Latin America. Africa, very interesting natural history, but it's not an area of high biodiversity. Even Central Africa, the, the, the African tropics, not that diverse. Southeast Asia, very interesting natural history, but not comparable in terms of the wealth of species that you see in what biologists call the neotropics, which is the tropical region of South America and Central America and into Southern Mexico. The neotropics are really the region where evolution goes amok and you have the greatest diversity of plants and of vertebrates and invertebrates and fungi and you name it and the neotropics has the foremost place for reasons that I have not read explained yet as far as I have read Part of it has to do with climatic stability over the eons, but it's not just climatic stability. There's more happening. It's not either the size, the extent of the landmass of equatorial uh, climates. There's something more uh, involved and I haven't read a good explanation. But anyway, the neotropics are number one in global diversity. So it's not a surprise that Brazil and Peru and Ecuador and Colombia uh, Bolivia and Venezuela are incredibly wealthy in their biodiversity and Central America as well, Costa Rica, Panama especially. But Mexico is one of the top four or five countries in the world according to the people keeping track, the conservation organizations that like to define what the hotspots are, what the priorities are, where money from the Global Bank and other, the World Bank and other sources should be going first. They like to draw these maps of the, the hotspots of biodiversity they're called. Mexico is big hotspot. It's Brazil, according to what I've read, Brazil is the area with the greatest diversity, huge country, of course. Colombia, Colombia is amazingly rich with the Andes and the Caribbean coast and the Amazon chunk that it has, and then the Pacific coast of Colombia, which is so incredibly rainy and moist and diverse. And then after those two giants in biodiversity, it's Mexico and Indonesia. And it's not clear who comes out first and it shouldn't be i mean it's not as i say this is not the olympics of biodiversity but mexico is up there how come mexico is far removed from the equator all the other three brazil colombia indonesia they're right along the equator mexico is halfway across the tropic of cancer way far north it shouldn't be part of the core countries of top biodiversity a major factor accounts for that and this has been worked out since i went to school when i went to school we learned that the area of greatest interest in mexico was chiapas the furthermost state that's where we expect to find the greatest diversity of plants and animals and we didn't expect to compete with the countries further to the south that was sort of mexican humility in biological terms when i was growing up but now we know otherwise. And how do we explain this? Well, we have come to realize, and this is within my own life, with my own experience in the last few decades, that we are unique eh, in a way that makes us different from the other countries of the neotropics. We are halfway between two biogeographical realms. We share the neotropics to the south, but we also have a heavy component 
of Nearctic flora and fauna. Plants and animals that we share, or lineages, I should say, that we share with areas to the north, and not just with Canada and the United States, but also with Northern Asia and Europe. And furthermore, and this is what is most interesting to us, Jenna, and it's something that we have tried to portray here at the garden, and I will try to explain later how, Mexico is distinct in having something that nobody else has. We, for a long time, were part of an ecological island. If you look at the degree of endemism, the number of biological lineages that are exclusive to Mexico, not shared with North America, not shared with Central and South America, the component is very high. Over 50% of the reptiles and amphibians, which are the oldest vertebrate lineages, are endemic. Over 50% of the plants of Mexico are endemic. You don't find them in Guatemala, you don't find them in Cuba, you don't find them in Florida, Texas, or Arizona. They're uniquely Mexican. Why? Why such a high percentage? Mexico behaves like if it were an island, like if it were Papua New Guinea or if it were Cuba. We were an island. In ecological terms, we were an island because the Central American land bridge is recent in geological terms. For a long time, we were abutting into the tropics. We were part of the tropical climate with tropical life zone, but isolated from other tropical regions because there was no land bridge to the south. And you see that in the flora and fauna of Mexico. When I was growing up, we, were th we used to think that certain orchids, and I'm, I bring orchids up because I have grown orchids since I was a kid. Orchids have always attracted me. Also cacti, but more orchids than cacti. Orchids were always something close to my heart. And there are orchids that I remember from my teenage years thinking, oh, this is something we share with Brazil. Oh, this is something we share with the Andes. No, these, it turns out, are different lineages and they originated here. And from here, some of them spread south. We always used to think the opposite way. We always used to think we are the receiving end of things, tropical things spreading north. Now we know that is not always the case. Yes, there are several assemblages that uh, came from the south, but the opposite pattern also happened. And that's what makes us so interesting for biologists because we are the evolutionary cradle or the evolutionary forge for many lineages that spread from here beyond. But this has created a new pride, Jenna, and we now talk about Mega Mexico. Mega Mexico being the geographical area where you see these lineages prevailing. And Mega Mexico runs into the southwestern United States and Mexi Mega Mexico spreads south towards uh, all the way to northern Nicaragua as being a naturally defined space in terms of the life forms and in the terms of the life histories of lineages of plants and animals that characterize and would make it different from other regions in the world. So Oaxaca stands again at the core of this. Oaxaca is the geographical center. Mega Mexico extends to the southwestern United States, Texas so through southeastern California, and it extends south into northern Nicaragua. That's as far as the um, distribution of lineages allow us to claim this is a coherent biogeographical province. There are more shared lineages here than with areas further to the north or further to the south. And these have their evolutionary history right here. They didn't migrate from the south, they didn't migrate from the north. So it's about the biological personality of Mexico, so to speak. Hey, welcome to the halfway point. Congratulations, you are halfway through. Just a quick reminder to like and subscribe to Down to Earth. I'm so excited that you're here. 
And without further ado, here's more of this amazing conversation that I had with Alejandro. As a kid, I was very drawn to plants. As I mentioned, I was growing orchids. We have a small house in Colonia Condesa in Mexico City, but it was close to Chapultepec, which is a park that goes back to pre-Columbian times. It was already a park in Tenochtitlan. It's where the drinking water of Tenochtitlan came from. It's a beautiful, huge park, and I love to spend time there. And I remember Chapultepec from before the times the National Anthropology Museum was built. But when that museum opened up, it was heaven for me. I would beg my parents to please allow me to go. When I started visiting the museum, I was too young to go on my own. So somebody would take me. And I would spend hours just going through the exhibits. I loved spending time. It was my treat to go to the museum. So I learned very early on about Mexico and about the cultural history of Mexico and about the contemporary cultures of Mexico at the same time that I was exposed to a huge urban park with all its native plant diversity. And I didn't really have much of a sense at that time of evolutionary history, but my father gave us, the four of us, it wasn't a gift to one of us in particular, but to all of us, he gave us the Spanish translation of Darwin's on the origin of species, on the origin of species. And we read parts of it as much as we could understand. And so since very early on, I started becoming conversant with evolutionary theory and became excited about it. It made sense to me. I had a religious upbringing from my grandmother, not from my parents, but my grandmother, the Oaxacan matron, very strong in the family as I portrayed, would take us to mass. And so we got exposed to Catholic creed. But I remember one night deciding that I wasn't going to follow because it did not make sense to me. And I found peace, spiritual peace in reading about natural history. So that's been foremost in my upbringing since very early on. And I have to give the credit to my father. My father was a physician. He was an anesthesiologist who had studied at the National University of Mexico with great sacrifice because the family was not very resourceful, but he was very smart and he worked himself through. And here's something that you will like, Jenna. He paid for part of his studies by being the announcer on a radio station <laughs> specializing in classical music. He loved that. He had a very good voice, a wonderful, modulated, very gentlemanly sounding voice. And he, he used it very effectively. He was very eloquent in the way he spoke. And he had great success in the radio business. And so that's how partly he paid for his studies. And then after graduating from UNAM, he went to work in Northwestern Mexico. This is part of family history and may not sound germane to the story, but I think it is. He went to Northwestern Mexico at a time when it was very isolated. It took him days to get there because he drove his own car. He had bought a car for himself and he drove his car out there, but there were no bridges and there were major rivers to traverse. So it had to be done by what was called pangas, which were rafters. And he eventually got to a place called El Fuerte in Northern Sinaloa, where he was the first physician trained at the National University to provide public health because he wasn't charging people. It was a social service in Mexico. Still to this day, you have to do when you want to graduate from 
a university, whether it be private or public, you have to do social service. That's something very good in the Mexican educational system. And my father did two years of social service. He was supposed to be doing only one, but he loved it so well, he stayed for an extra year. He did social service in, in uh, Sinaloa. He got to know the people of Sinaloa. It's a different culture from the rest of Mexico. It's the area that is most productive in agricultural terms. And today we associate it with the narco. That's where a lot of the, the poppy is produced and a lot of the marijuana. At that time, it was only beginning. We're talking about the 40s, early 50s. He did very well there. He uh, saved uh, earnings. People uh, were very thankful, very grateful to him saving their lives. And he saved what had been given to him as gifts. And with that money, he paid his way to travel to Washington State, where he did a residence in anesthesiology at King County Hospital in Seattle. And that was a wonderful opportunity for him to expand not only his medical training, but his cultural skills. And he, he loved the time that he spent in the United States. He was very impressed with the educational system in the United States. So he decided that all of his children should have the same experience. And he, he met my mother there in Washington State, and they went back to Mexico City. And we were born and grew up in Mexico City, but he provided the funds for all of us to study in the United States. He had this certainty that we were going to benefit from it, and he wanted us to be exposed to it. And in fact, my two brothers and my sister stayed in the United States. They got married and now have their families in the United States. I'm the only one who came back to Mexico. In the United States, I applied to Tulane because of the Middle American Research Institute. The Middle American Research Institute is a wonderful museum at Tulane University and a research center that has done groundbreaking work in Mesoamerican archaeology, Mesoamerican ethnohistory, and Mesoamerican ethnography since the early 20th century. And big names in anthropology are associated with the MARI. I was attracted, I was drawn to the MARI, so I applied to Tulane and I went there. And while I was at Tulane, I, I have to say, I got a little bit disillusioned with uh, the line of anthropology that I was being exposed to and I became restless and I started exploring physiological psychology and evolutionary psychology and ethology and neurobiology. So I started taking courses in biology, uh, physiology, cell biology, but also many courses that were offered through the psychology department. And I ended up doing a double major in anthropology and in physiological psychology. And I wrote two honors thesis. One was on the ethnography of the area where the De Avila family came from. And the other paper was <laughs> tracing the LHRH pathways. It's the luteinizing hormone releasing hormone, a neurohormone in the hamster brain. <laughs> so with that experience, I applied for a National Science Foundation grant and I got it. And I was very happy because I went to Berkeley. I had wanted to go to Berkeley in the first place, to be honest to you, but my parents thought Berkeley would be too radical for me. They were afraid that I was way too liberal. I was really going to be in a difficult situation in terms of my own safety. My parents were concerned about me because I was kind of a wild kid and they thought it wasn't a good idea to go to Berkeley right after high school. So that's one of the reasons I went to Tulane instead. But when I could do my own decision, because I, had, I didn't need to ask them for money anymore, I was financially independent since I had received this fellowship, I decided now is the time to go to Berkeley. And I did, and it was wonderful. Going to Berkeley was really intellectual liberation for me. I cannot adequately describe to you how 
well I felt at Berkeley. It was like, finally, I felt like I'm arriving home. This is home for me. And I still feel like that way. Uh, Berkeley is unique. When I was uh, um, doing my master's at Berkeley in the 80s, remember that's the time uh, when Ronald Reagan was sending interventionist uh, groups to Nicaragua. It was the time of the Sandinistas and also the war in El Salvador and Guatemala as well, the 80s. And there were, of course, still the memories of the involvement of the United States in Vietnam and getting the US out of Vietnam. And in Berkeley, there was a bumper sticker. Elsewhere in the United States, you saw bumper sticker, get us out of Nicaragua, get us out of El Salvador. And in Berkeley, there was a bumper sticker, get Berkeley out of the United States. That was the mood of the times, and I really resonated to that. At Berkeley, I, with the support of the National Science Foundation Fellowship, I did work in psychobiology. I was working with rodents. I continued to work with rodents. And I did my master's degree working in rodent neurobiology. No longer with LHRH, no longer with a neuropeptide that I, had, that I had worked on for my undergraduate degree, but still in the same neuropharmacological field I was working with encephalins. And that was a very interesting time for me. It was a productive time, but there were two major factors that decided me, that made me decide to no longer pursue this. First and foremost, I felt restless. I felt homesick. For a time, I had toyed with the idea of staying at the, staying in the United States like my siblings, but the pull to go back to Mexico became increasingly strong. And I learned that the laboratory where I was working, unbeknownst to me and to my fellow graduate students, was being funded by the US military. The line of work we were doing had applications because of addictions. And I thought it was so unethical that the researcher who led the laboratory hadn't told us. I felt very bad. So I pulled the two things together and I said, this is it. So I took a year off. I went to Alaska. I put the National Science Foundation Fellowship on hold. I went to Alaska. I worked at a salmon canning plant, <laughs> Jenna. I, for the first time in my life, I earned my breath with the sweat of my brow. It was horrible work. We would get up at six o'clock and sometimes it was 10 o'clock and we still were working because you have to work fast because that's when the salmon came in. And lucky for me, I was hired, I was selected. I was chosen by a, a crew of Japanese. The company where I happened to have landed literally was joint ownership Japanese and American in Kenai, Alaska. And the Japanese people could care less about the uh, flesh of the salmon. They were interested in the row. So they chose me and they trained me to pack the salmon row, to select it, to process it, and to pack it. And I learned the whole process. It was really neat. It was working with the hands, but it was really backbreaking labor. But I survived and I thrived and I earned more money in a six week period than I've ever made in my life. And with those earnings, I came here with a backpack and my hair down to my shoulders. And I started on the state of Michoacan, hitchhiked or hiked my way to Oaxaca. And it was wonderful. It was safe back in that time. People were so generous to me. I learned so much and I decided this is my life. This is my path. And I just went back to Berkeley to finish my degree, to get my master's and came to Oaxaca and I've been here since. You've still continued to do research since then, right? But your research is focused on different er areas and aspects like textiles and, and plants, right? Um, you wrote a book about plants, I think in 2006, La Espina y el Fruto. Um, yes, it's a little book about the garden. 
And it's a book that is a tribute to the poetry of Pablo Neruda because he wrote very eloquently about Mexico, Mexico, Florido y Espinudo. And that is a theme for our garden because the garden is full of thorns as you experienced when you visited it. And thorns for us are very significant. And I try to reflect it in the title of the little book. The little book portrays the beautiful photography of Cecilia Salcedo, a very gifted photographer. She did some photography at the garden, but mostly she took plant samples, seeds, fruit, some blossoms to her studio and did very high quality black and white portraits of plant structures. And they're very beautiful. But the little essay that I wrote to accompany her photography, actually not that little, it's a lengthy essay, but I develop the notion of thorns as, um, how could I say it? It's a light motif. Are you familiar with the term light motif? Of course you are, Jenna. Sorry for asking. The spines, the thorns, the spikes are a light motif in our garden. Our garden is full of thorns. And as a consequence, Jenna, our garden is full of ghosts. And I develop that story in that essay because the thorns harken back to ghosts, to something that no longer exists. When you think about it, why is it that the plants of Mexico and other areas of the neotropics and even beyond the neotropics, why is it that plants invest so heavily in thorns? Agaves are full of thorns, cacti are full of thorns, but also palms, many of the palms of this part of the world loaded with thorns. Also, for example, the kapok tree, the ceiba, we call it in Spanish, from with Caribbean roots, the name. Why does the ceiba have all these spikes on its trunk? And why group after group, family after family? It's not that they are inheriting the spikes and the thorns from a common ancestor, but they have developed them independently. Some thorns are derived anatomically from leaves, or the thorns are derived from roots, as in some of the palms, and yet others are derived from protuberances of the bark, excrescences of the bark. There are all kinds of origins of the roots, but the plants respond, defending themselves, arming themselves. Why such an investment in defense? What's going on here? Because if you look at the current context, you say, well, why invest so much? A deer, it's not gonna harm the trunk of a ceiba. A monkey might climb up to the branches, but what is a monkey going to do? Why protect its green tissue, its green bark from a monkey or from a taper or from a rabbit? It makes no sense. The thorns evoke ghosts because they co-evolve with a megafauna that is no longer with us. That's what explains. It's the large mammals with huge jaws that the animals needed to protect themselves. And there were more large mammals here in the Americas in general, not just Oaxaca, not just Mexico. There were more large mammals here than in Africa today. We are so familiar with the elephants and the rhinoceros and the hippopotamus and the giraffes and the water buffalo and on and on. That's what draws the tourists to the Serengeti and to the photo safaris. Well, here, before human arrival, about 13, 16,000 years ago, there were more kinds of megafauna than in Africa today. Why are they no longer here? There's convincing evidence that humans wiped them in. And it wasn't so much hunting as environmental change. Humans arrive with a sophisticated technology. In Africa, the fauna had time to co-evolve with humans, with humans developing social and cultural complexity. 
But here, the first wave of humans is already quite adroit culturally and technologically. I mean, we see them as rudimentary because they were hunting with bows and arrows or with spears, but they were managing fire and they had dogs. They had domesticated dogs, China. They made all the difference. So they really changed the scenario quite fast. And numerous lineages of large mammals, but also some large birds and some large reptiles became extinct as a consequence. And now what we have is the ghosts. We have the thorns remembering. We have the plants memory reflected in the garden. So that is a theme that I developed in that uh, essay inspired by that line from Pablo Neruda, Mexico, Florido y Espinudo. In one of your interviews, you mentioned that Oaxaca exists all because of Cochinil. And how, it, number one, is that true? <laughs> and, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, Jenna, that Oaxaca exists because of Cochinil, but the city became what we see today because of the economic bonanza of Cochinil. Cochinil is fascinating. And as, uh, uh, as I have uh, worked on it, I have learned a lot more. Thanks to a colleague, a number of uh, friends, but especially a colleague whom I have yet to meet, but I have corresponded with him. His name is Alex Van Damme. He's my tocayo, you know, my tocayo, of being, having the same name, Alex. I was called Alex as a child. Alex Van Damme is an entomologist. He it got his uh, PhD degree from uh, also the University of California, but in his case at Davis. And he worked out the molecular sequence, the genetic sequence of domesticated cochineal. And he has also worked on the wild species of, this, of cochineal and their distribution throughout the Americas. And he has clarified for us the natural history of cochineal and the cultural history of cochineal. And the results are fascinating. There are still some points where some critical voices, and I think they're overreacting, perhaps because of a little bit of professional jealousy, uh, he still has to work some points out. But the overall picture is increasingly clear and well substantiated. Let me try to portray it as I understand it. Jenna, cochineal is a neotropical lineage. The technical name for it is Dactylopius. Dactylopius is a lineage in the scale insects, the coccidae, okay? And these are hemipterans. They are distantly related to aphids. Aphids are, as you know, scourges over the garden. Every gardener hates aphids because they can really do a lot of damage in the garden. And the coccids and specifically wild cochineal are similarly noxious. They can kill a plant. But Dactylopius is very specific in the range of host plants it will thrive on. It will not live on just any kind of cactus, but only on what we call in Mexico, nopales. The technical term for nopales is opuntias. The opuntias and their relatives are a group of cacti that are quite distinctive in their evolutionary history from the rest of the cactus family. And a, a colleague a, who is interested in plant taxonomy has worked out their evolutionary history. The opuntias originate in the Andes. But in Mexico, when they spread north, they found numerous opportunities to diversify. There is less depth, and you can see that in the molecular sequence, in the gene sequence, there's less diversity in uh, Mexico, but they have had the opportunity to, to occupy very large areas and uh, climatically and also differentiated by soil types and geology, geological substrate, they have flourished in Mexico and we have more species of opuntias in Mexico 
than in the Andes where they originate, which is remarkable. Anyway, the Dactylopius lineage is exclusively feeding on nopales. They don't parasitize any other kind of cactus. So wherever you have opuntias, you have Dactylopius, and they occur from Southern California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, all the way to Patagonia, the, the drylands of uh, Chile and Argentina, okay? There are uh, at least 11 species of Dactylopius in the wild. But what we call cochineal, what was the source of a beautiful red dye is a domesticated species. You don't find it in the wild. It's been looked for and it hasn't been found anywhere. It's only known by people raising it. And for the longest time, people thought it originated in Peru. And I hate to say this, but some Peruvian colleagues are still absolutely sure that it is Peruvian in origin. Well, Alex Van Damme has shown otherwise, because in doing the sequencing of the DNA, he found in three little farms here in the Valley of Oaxaca, more genetic diversity than in a stretch of 1,500 kilometers of the Andes from Peru all the way into Northern Argentina. The diversity that he found in the DNA of the Andean cochineal is nested within the Oaxacan diversity. So it now looks pretty conclusively that cochineal was domesticated here, perhaps not in the Valley of Oaxaca, but in, cent in, in central southern Mexico. This is where we have the greatest genetic diversity. And here's the clincher to the argument. The same thing holds true, Jenna, for the host plant. In the Andes, cochineal has been produced as a dye stuff since pre-Columbian times. It is well known in the textiles of the desert coast of Peru, which were so well preserved. There are lots of examples of alpaca and vicuña and other chameleon fibers tied with cochineal in the pre-Columbian textiles of the coast of Peru. And so people thought this is where cochineal was domesticated. But cochineal was always grown to this day on an opuntia, a species of opuntia that is not native to the Andes. It was taken to the south from Mexico. We have conclusive evidence, the same researcher who figured out the natural history of the genus Opuntia also worked on the genetic history of the foremost species used as the host plant for domesticated cochineal, which is called Opuntia ficus indica. Here in Oaxaca, it's called Nopal de Castilla, which is an indication of its quality because everything good had to come from Spain, of course. <laughs> bias, cultural bias, internalized colonization if I may have an aside. The host plant for cochineal to this day in the Andes is not an Andean opuntia, it's the Mexican opuntia, which went naturalized along with the cochineal, but it originates here. So the genetic evidence is pretty conclusive. Both the host plant and the insect parasite that produces the dye were domesticated here but they're cultural products. And so the question becomes, if they're cultural products, first of all, how could they have spread south since they require a dry climate and the intervening lands of the Chocó and the coast of Colombia are incredibly wet. How did that come about? The, 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 the host plant and the insect cannot survive in the, in the drenching rain, constant rain of that part of the trip. It had to be, and this is something that Alex Van Damme works, uh, writes about in his dissertation, it had to be long distance trace 
by seafaring canoes doing a fast voyage from Mexico to Peru. Isn't that amazing? Jen? You just blew my mind. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yes, <laughs> it is mind blowing. Like it is mind blowing. Charles Mann like type of stuff right now that like that's going on. Like, I just... think it's beyond it, Jenna. <laughs> I think it's beyond it. I think it's beyond it because it really changes our outlook on cultural communication in the past. But the proof is in the pudding. The cochineal is shared. And we know for a fact that this is not a colonial introduction, but it goes way back. Okay, so I have a, I have a silly question. Couldn't someone just like put it in a backpack and transport it through? I mean, it, like, we, it, it explain to me one more time how seafaring canoes are the way that this got to Peru. Like, couldn't someone just put, like, carry the plant in a jar or something and transplant it there? First of all, to carry the plant would have been very, very heavy to make the voyage all the way from southern Mexico to the drylands of Peru, where it can thrive. In the intervening lands, it's too wet for the plant and the insect to thrive. It does not make sense for people to have carried it in backpacks. It makes sense because of the weight of the plant for the survival to have been through seafaring canoes. If it were like maize, because we know maize did the same journey. Maize was domesticated in Mexico. There is no, but people, again, some South American colleagues retain the pride. No, maize is South America. No, there's early maize from the Andes. No, sorry. The relatives of maize are only found here. There are no wild relatives of maize in the Andes. It had to be domesticated here and then spread south. But in the case of maize, it could have been farmer to farmer spreading north to south over a long period of time. Why? Because you can acclimate the maize to drier areas or to wetter areas. You can acclimate it to cooler climates or to warmer climates. Maize is a very flexible genome. And we see that in the diversity of maize. You made it at a point with Malena on the interview with Malena Martinez that there are all these land races of potatoes that are so amazing. Well, maize I believe is even more diverse than the potatoes and maize thrives from sea level all the way to 4,000 meters altitude in the Andes. Potatoes don't. You cannot grow potatoes in the tropical lowlands. They just don't do it. Maize does. Maize is an incredible story. That's another spiel that I can do, but I think we're running well, out of time. I have a question about the nopales and... and yes, I'm, I'm going, I'm getting there. Okay, getting great. There. So maize, maize we, we can say, could have spread farmer to farmer over hundreds or thousands of years from Mexico to Peru and all the way to Argentina and Chile. But cochineal couldn't have gone that way. Why? Because the wet lowlands in between Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, there's still, in Guanacaste, northwestern Costa Rica, you still have dry tropical climate where you can grow the nopales. But from there on south, all the way to Tumbes, which is northwestern Peru, it's too wet to grow the nopales. It's way too wet to grow the nopales. And to be carrying them across with your backpack, it would have been a very heavy journey for what? It doesn't make sense to explain it, but if you think they were already organized, in trade networks and they were doing this as something regular year by year it makes sense that they would have used the seafaring canoes to also ship down the plant heavy plant with its insect parasites now why do i bring in the trade networks when spaniards arrive in the uh, pacific coast of mexico the mouth of the Balsas River, what was called back then Zacatula, today Lazaro Cárdenas, which is the big port 
and also a place where there's an iron uh, foundry. In Zacatula, the first Europeans to arrive, they hear that a yearly expedition of big canoes arrives. People come from the south and they come to trade and they have to stay for months. They cannot go back right away because they have to wait for the currents, the sea currents to work in their favor. And this was something that they knew. This was something that they expected because they were trading. This was happening in 1520s when the first Europeans arrived in that part where the canoe fleets were disembarking. So we have the historical evidence and we have the genetic evidence and it congeals into a coherent story. Isn't this beautiful? Amazing. Yes. All the things that you can learn when you study plant DNA. <laughs> But it's not just the plant DNA, because there's a further observation that I had done even before I encountered the work of Alex Van Damme. So that's why I say it's a bigger spiel. It's my cochineal spiel, Jenna. I had done the observation that the linguistics points to the same thing, Jenna. In Southern Mexico, you have names for cochineal, independently coined in the various languages. It's not one term borrowed from one language to the other, but each language has developed their own term for cochineal. In the Andes, you have one term. In the Andes, it's called magnum or magno, and it's the same term wherever Quechua or Aymara are spoken which is all the highlands where cochineal is grown today. The inter-Andean valleys, dry valleys, where the cactus, the opuntia, the Mexican opuntia thrives, and the insect that provides the dye stuff. So why a single term? Why didn't the various languages, of which there used to be several before Quechua spread and took over, why is the term borrowed into Aymara. And why do you have a stretch of thousands of kilometers having just one single term for cochineal? It makes sense if this was introduced. And here's my counterexample to make the case. We have the same happening in reverse in the case of cacao, which we have already spoken with our shared addiction to chocolate, Jenna. In the case of cacao, all the languages from Purépecha in Michoacán to the Mayan languages in the highlands of Chiapas, Guatemala, and in the Yucatan, they have one term. They have borrowed the one term, which is the same term that Spanish borrowed, cacao, cacao, cacao huatl in, in Nahuatl and cognates in all the other languages. But they took the borrowed term. Why? Because cacao was introduced. Cacao came from the Amazon. Cacao, we know for sure, is an introduction. It made the reverse journey of maize and cochineal. And today, in all the Mesoamerican languages, you have the borrowed term, not independently coined terms for cacao. You see what I'm what I'm arguing? You see my argument? I Lingu do see your argument. <laughs> linguistics, linguistics shows you the same. And furthermore, there's one more piece of evidence that I had, all, that I had also pointed out. In uh, Oaxaca and in Mexico in general, cochineal has several natural enemies, insect predators that feed on the cochineal and they are a pain in the butt for the people producing the dye stuff. The colonial accounts, the historical documents from the 1600s, especially the 1700s, when there was a peak in the market and the demand for cochineal, they describe endlessly how difficult it is to grow cochineal because the growers have to be constantly picking out the noxious insects that will 
feed on the cochineal. There are at least nine insect enemies that will feed on cochineal and are enemies of the producers of the dye stuff. In the Andes, one has been recorded. One a problem for the producers. And in fact, the production of cochineal is totally different in the Andes from what it is here. Here, it's an intensive labor endeavor, caring for the plants, caring for the insects. In the Andes, it's a naturalized plant that is let grow wild. It is allowed to propagate by itself, both the plant and the insect. And people just harvest the insect. They don't need to worry about seeding the uh, cactus or uh, pro, uh, propagating the insect. They just go and harvest as if it were a wild resource because there, there's only one, apparently there's only one insect that will thrive on the cochineal. Consequently, being a much less labor intensive enterprise, they sell their cochineal much cheaper. Oaxaca can no longer uh, compete in the market. Here, you want to grow cochineal, uh, you run against prices that you cannot compete with. And that is the fact. People here have tried to revive cochineal again and again and again. But the price of cochineal is way down because the people in Bolivia, in Chile, in Peru, in the Canary Islands are elsewhere. They're taking it to the market much cheaper. Why? Because they don't need to worry about those insect pests that are attacking your crop. So that's another line of argument. That's just another, I didn't know there's such a rivalry between you guys, like Peru and Mexico. I didn't know there was this kind of like back and forth thing going on. <laughs> there has been the rivalry among historians and among uh, the people working on the uh, folk art of both areas and especially the textiles since Cochinil is used mostly, not exclusively, but mostly for textiles. And for a long time, the verdict was Peru, Peru, Peru has the diversity. And there are books you can read, even people working out of the Metropolitan Art Museum in New York. I mean, their publications as recently as este, four or five years ago, saying the Andes are the area where Cochinillo was domesticated. Sorry, no. Wow. Not true. Next question. But, uh, but, but, but uh, yeah. before you, you pose the next question, Jenna, I, I, what I wanted to say, again, it's not the issue of local pride, of having a region-based attitude. It's understanding. It's understanding what's behind this. And it's not just understanding what happened in the past, but it's also understanding what leads us to defend our position so staunchly and to, to be so misguided and not willing to open our minds up to look at the evidence, to look at things more critically. Yeah. Wow. Um, you all have scientific research actively happening at the Ethnobotanical Garden. There's a greenhouse there where people are studying plants, right? Um, Not really, Jenna. I have to say that one of my major misgivings is that I haven't been able to put together a team because of lack of funding. Because of lack of funding, I have to underline that. Because of lack of funding, I haven't been able to put together a team where we can really devote people to do full-time research. We do research on our spare time and as limited as it is, the research that is happening is basically observations of how plants respond to our treatments. We keep track of all the plants that we're cultivating. We have extensive log books of how they're responding to various treatments, when we have propagated them, how many progeny we were able to produce, how they have responded to heavy rains, uh, when they have died, we keep track of that, what diseases and what treatments we have had to subject them. That's basically the research that we do at the garden itself. Sounds like I research. Myself, that, is, <laughs> that is research, but it's not taxonomic research. And the ethnobotanical research is basically my responsibility. I've been working with colleagues uh, who are documenting indigenous languages of Oaxaca. There's very 
much work being done here. And here's another uh, line that I would like to draw from your conversation with Malena. Oh, like there's you, another there, Peru versus Mexico. Or no, 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 no. <laughs> it's more interesting than just a confrontation, Jenna. It's actually you. It wasn't Malena. It was actually you oh. who brought up, a, you read that there's 47 registered languages spoken in Peru. Here's the information from the ethnologue, Jenna. I will give you the link. The Ethnologue is a database that is constantly updated. The edition that I checked is the current edition, 2020. And this is a big group of linguists working all over the world. Not the entire linguistic establishment is agreement with them. This is the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which has a history of evangelism. These are linguists who started translating the scriptures and they have their own methodology and not everybody agrees with how they classify the languages, but it has the advantage of being a global database and it has the further advantage of constantly being revised. And from what I have read, they have taken criticism into account and they have reclassified some of the languages. I can attest to that in the case of Mexico. So they're open to change. It's not like they're entrenched in their ways. Anyway, the advantage of the ethnologue is that you can compare different areas of the world and following the same criteria of classification, whether you agree with them or not, they're consistent criteria of classification. So I checked the ethnologue and according to the ethnologue, there are 93 languages in Peru spoken today. There are some languages that became extinct, but in Peru, according to the criteria of classification of the ethnologue, there are 93 languages. Okay. How many languages are spoken in Mexico according to the ethnologue? Would you have a guess, Jen? 300 something. 288. In Oaxaca, according to the ethnologue, 162. That's almost twice wow. the number of the entire country of Peru, according to the criteria of classification of the ethnologue. Okay. Now, this is not I in any it. way, <laughs> this is not in any way belittling the cultural diversity of the Andes or any other region of the world. It's just to point out that according to the criteria of classification of the ethnologue, this region of the world stands out. And it is comparable to only three other areas in the world. According to the ethnologue, it is by far the area of greatest linguistic diversity. And for us, that means also cultural diversity because language is not isolated from the rest of culture, right? There's only three other areas of the world with comparable levels of linguistic diversity. One is the highlands that are shared by Nigeria and Cameroon. The other one is the Eastern Himalayas in Northeastern India, Assam, basically, Northern Myanmar, and Southern China, okay? That's another area of great linguistic diversity. And finally, and foremost, is Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea has by far the greatest linguistic diversity in the world. Now, you will then ask, how come those four areas? I think that it has to do, Jenna, at least partly with plants. It has to do with the roots of agriculture. Okay, you gotta explain now, just, just dive into it, go for it, another spiel. It is not a coincidence, I think, that Western Africa, especially those highland areas, Southeast Asia, but especially the Eastern Himalayas, and most saliently, Highland New Guinea are areas of plant domestication. Think of it. Here is the birthplace of maize, beans, squash, amaranth, 
chía, agaves, o puntia cacti, and several others that are less well known for an English speaking audience. In Papua New Guinea, we have the birthplace of sugarcane, of taro, apparently, a root crop, of bananas, and other less well crops. In the Eastern Himalayas, you are sharing, from what I have read, the area where rice was domesticated, or at least part of the region where it was first cultivated, where several other crops seem to have their origin. And in Western Africa, you have another assortment of crops that have their their, their history right there, not brought in uh, from the Mediterranean or from Western Asia, but local cultivars. And one which comes uh, to my mind right away is uh, the yam. Yam uh, as a crop uh, is uh, something that, uh, from what I've read, it comes from West Africa and others as well, independent from the Eastern African highlands, where you have a different assortment of crops in, in Ethiopia, which also happens to be an area of great linguistic diversity. So what am I aiming for? Uh, and this is not something that, that I started, but other people have written about it. It looks like areas where agriculture arose are areas where those people who started cultivating those crops had an advantage and could spread and could gain ground at the expense of languages that waned. And those people who were spreading agriculture, who were successfully growing their foods in new geographical areas, were undergoing evolutionary diversification, which happens all the time. It's not something that languages are constantly changing. The fact that we are able to read 16th century texts in English or in Spanish is because change has become lessened by the written word, but change is constantly happening in all languages. And so for each one of these areas, we have some families that have spread and flourished and diversified incredibly. And so in the case of Mesoamerica, you have one lineage, the Otomangan languages, which happen to have their center of diversity right here in Oaxaca. And the mystic languages, which is the group of languages that I studied for my dissertation, are part of that family. In uh, Papua New Guinea, you have actually several uh, lineages that become uh, very fragmented and very diversified. In the case of the Eastern Himalayas, you again have several language families, but the Sino-Tibetan languages have their roots right there, as well as the Hmong Mien uh, family uh, and other linguistic families. In the uh, highlands of uh, Nigeria and Cameroon, it looks like that is the birthplace of the most widespread language family in Africa, which is the Niger-Congo family. So there's a correlation between cradles of agriculture and linguistic and cultural diversity. That's the argument. Wow, you just blew my mind. <laughs> wow. Um. But I wanted to say, to go back to Oaxaca. By just how crazy cool the world is. Like, this is just insane. Like, are you just, like, there's so much that you study and that you dive into and that you're, you know, like these different touch points with, with culture and with nature. I mean, it's just, it's all, it's like, it's even fair to separate those two, right? Because it's just, it's all the same thing. It's gotta be overwhelming. Well, the, point we, the point we try to make here at the garden is for people to gain a sense of that, to become curious. It's too much information for a visit of even two hours, which is how long the tours last in French, German, and English. 
because in our experience, that's how much people want. For the Spanish tours, people are restless after one hour, so we cut the, the tours in Spanish. There are some people who are interested in one more, but mostly people just want to look at some sites. But in the English, uh, French and German tours would devote more time. This is too much information for two hours, even for two hours. But you whet people's appetite. And people then are invited to come back and go into the library. The library for us is crucial. We are an ethnobotanical garden because we have a library. And the library is the gift of Francisco. Francisco will tell me every two, three months, Alejandro, where's your list? Where's your book list? He would buy like a Santa Claus book list. He would buy whatever books we wanted. He, would, he had a network of people in Los Angeles, in Mexico City, elsewhere, who were buying books for his libraries. This was part of a network of libraries that he was funding. The foremost library was the library of Iago, the Institute of Graphic Arts, which is the prime art library in Mexico, perhaps in Latin America. To this day, an incredible library, an incredible resource for students. But we benefited from that. And we are so grateful. The spirit of Francisco really lives on in the library. Wow. Wow, so if in, a, in a perfect world, um, thinking about the future of Oaxaca, but the Ethnobotanical Garden and the Textile Museum in particular, what what areas would you like to grow in apart from scientific research? Like where else, like if you could really have unlimited budget, what would you do? Okay, here is something that I will be chastised by the state government officials once it's made public. And you may want to edit it from the final product, but I have to say it, Jenna. The garden is self-sufficient. The garden produces more than twice what we need to pay our payroll, to pay our operating expenses and investment. But we don't get it. Why? Because even though we do the upkeep of the garden and we make it possible for the social events, especially weddings, to take place right here, all the income of that doesn't go to the garden. All the income goes to the state government. Now, the state government does provide the payroll, very limited payroll. I have to tell you, I was getting more as a stipend as a graduate student from my fellowship than what I'm getting today as a salary from the garden. I survive thanks to the generosity of the Harp Foundation through the Textile Museum. But the salary here at the garden after 22 years of service is miserable. And I am especially hurt, and I have to say this is something that hurts me. It's not just a fact, it's something that hurts me emotionally. My fellow workers have been equally devoted. They don't have the training that I do, but they're here from eight o'clock in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon, every day of the week and Saturdays until one o'clock. They have been here, some of them, just as long as I have been, 22 years now, and they're earning peanuts. That is not fair because the garden allows the state government to more than triple what we receive from the state government for our budget, payroll, and operating expenses. Let me add to that. We have absolutely zero job benefits, no social security, no medical insurance, no paid leave, no vacations, zero. I have had to raise funds on my own to establish a solidarity fund in agreement with my fellow workers. All 24 of us have voted and we have all voted, yes, let's start, let's, all pool money together, not money that we get out of salary, but money that I have raised outside. And I have to give thanks to Mission Garden in Tucson, who is our sister garden. And they have been very generous and they have given us every year a big donation that has allowed us to capitalize this solidarity fund. With that solidarity fund, we've been able to face crisis, but we get zero from the government. If we were able 
to manage the funds that come through the social events that take place here, thanks to our work, thanks to the fact that we created this. People are attracted to get, to get married here, to celebrate their wedding because of the beauty of the garden. We get zero, but we could be more than self-sustaining. We could be investing the surplus into finishing the garden because the garden is not finished. So when you ask me, why would you like to see? That's what I would like to see. Now I have to add that I have been doing a work with the new federal administration, two years now into the administration, almost two years, but no in terms of that it really has changed the political scenario in Mexico. We are very hopeful with the current, current administration with all its contradictions, one of which the Trump visit yesterday and the day before. But that's an aside. We are really hopeful because we do really see a change in political culture in Mexico. We see the roots for true democracy and we see the roots for social redress and the new equivalent the equivalent of the national science foundation in the united states the mexican equivalent is called conacit consejo nacional de ciencia y tecnología the national council for science and technology they have chosen us as the model to establish a network of ethno biological gardens where they put out a call for proposals nationally for uh, requesting that every region in Mexico propose an ethnobiological garden. We couldn't be more honored. And we participated in the call for uh, proposals and we have been awarded. We're still not working on it, but we have been awarded funding and we are really hopeful because it's something that will be ongoing and renewed. And we now see the possibility of doing a four-year cycle, which would really allow us to finish the garden, to bring to fruition the vision that we share with Francisco from day one, which still hasn't happened because we haven't Wait. had the support. But now we now we can see that as a possibility. It's not finished? No, it's not finished. No, well, there's still gaps in the garden. We need services for visitors. We have facilities bathrooms that are half built they're not functional because we didn't have the funds to finish them they're almost done but they require more investment we have benches in mind for people to rest we have whole sections devoted to children devoted to people who are blind who cannot uh, see we want them to be able to approach plants and crush them and smell them and feel them we have a section devoted to the sacred plants that which we cannot have out in the open because some of them are illegal and some of them would easily be the supply for somebody wanting to have a recreational experience at home. So we would need to have that area specially guarded. But one of the interests, the special interests of Oaxaca, and this is something that was realized by Dr. Richard Evans Schultes at Harvard, he's a legendary figure. He did his dissertation research here in Oaxaca. And later on, he wrote, after having uh, surveyed the entire globe with, through the work of collaborators, not just himself, that Oaxaca is the area of greatest diversity of entheogens. Entheogens is a respectful term for what most people call drugs or for what people call psychedelic drugs or um, you know what I mean, you know, the hippie stuff. Oaxaca is, and this is something that Richard Evan Schultes stated, Oaxaca is the area of greatest diversity of entheogens. Isn't that amazing? People here have been open to use the sacred mushrooms, but also the sacred herbs, the sacred seeds, to experience an approach to the spiritual realm. And that's something we want to show for sure. 
but we don't have yet the means to do it. We, we need to enclose that area. And we need to provide services for our workers. We don't have a shower. We don't have a place for them to change their clothes, to keep a locker. We have very rudimentary services. We want to provide dignified services for them. That's all in the making, Jenna. That's in the future, but we're hopeful now that we have this um, approval by CONACYT. CONACYT has a, we're in the process right now of signing the agreement to receive the funding. So we're really hopeful that over the next four years, we'll be able to finish the garden as we envision it with Francisco Toledo in 1993, when we dreamt about this. Well, congratulations on, uh, on receiving that uh, admission. And, uh, and so do I understand you correctly that there's go that you're going to help guide the process of creating more ethnobotanical gardens throughout Mexico? Now? We're already doing that, Jenna. We're already doing that. We have received the visits of people interested in doing that in their home cities, in their home states. And uh, some people who haven't been able to come because of the pandemic. In fact, we had scheduled a visit by people from Baja California in uh, June or May was it, which couldn't happen because everything dissolved into thin air with the pandemic, but yeah. uh, that's in the future. And, and we're also the exchanging information through the internet. Wow. <laughs> so in the next 15 to 20 years, there's gonna be a lot more of these. Uh, well, hopefully sooner, Jenna, because this is, uh, Mexico has six year cycles. There's no reelection here. And there's no telling what's going to happen when this administration ends. We're hoping that there will be continuity, but there's no assurance. So we're hoping that by 2024, at least the seeds will have been planted for the network of ethnobiological gardens throughout Mexico. And some people, some gardens are, are much more ahead in that sense. And we would hope, that we would hope other areas in Latin America would follow suit. Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, you know, when going back to what you were saying about biodiversity and kind of the, just the opportunity that you find throughout the Americas is just, you know, for this kind of work is, is incredible, right? And there's also the people that understand what those plants yes. like, do and how they work in those yes. areas so i mean and it's, it's not just like it's not just the plants it's not just the plants in the traditional way it's not just of becoming curious of what was it like in the past but i would like to resonate to the interview that you had with caldwell esselstein where you discussed the benefits of plant-based nutrition that is so important for us jenna and he he drew the example of the Tarahumara people in northwestern Mexico, and he discussed the three sisters, maize, beans, and squash. The three sisters are not exclusive to the Tarahumara people. They're not exclusive to Mexico, but the three sisters originated here. The earliest archaeological evidence and the greatest gen genetic diversity under cultivation for maize is here in the state of Oaxaca that's been widely documented. A, it may be that it was domesticated further west. Uh, there's debate about that, but the earliest traces in terms of people finding stuff in early rock shelters is from here. And at least in terms of macro remains, there's starch grains and pollen that have been found further west that seem to be earlier, but there's debate about that. But perhaps most compelling is the evidence of the current genetic diversity of the maize that people still plant. Oaxaca stands out way and above any other region in Mexico or Guatemala or further south in the number of land races of maize. And many of them are exclusive Oaxaca. I shouldn't say many. A number of them are only found here. They're not grown elsewhere. But that's not the key point. I mean, that again is, seems to be a reflection of Oaxacan pride. What I'm aiming for this is not just a lesson for the past. And it is not a lesson just for foodies either. It's not about glorifying Oaxacan gastronomy so that you go to expensive restaurants. No, we aim at the garden to educate ourselves about nutrition, 
but also about a sustainable lifestyle. We're growing foods that we think are crucial and not just for foodies, for everybody. Dr. Esselstyn talked about the three sisters, but beyond the three, the three sisters, which provide most of the carbohydrate, most of the protein, the minerals and vitamins come from green leafy vegetables, quelites we call them. Quelites are incredibly diverse. There are hundreds of species that are consumed as quelites. Quelite means green leafy vegetable, whether you, it, whether you eat it raw or you eat it cooked. Quelite, we don't have a Spanish equivalent. We borrow it from Nahuatl, the language of the Mexica people of central Mexico. But all the languages in Oaxaca have a term. Well, not all of them, but most of them have it. This is something that has really interested me. This was the focus of my dissertation. The terms for labeling green leafy vegetable. I already mentioned that earlier. Quelite is how we talk about it in Spanish, but we had to borrow it from indigenous language because there's no language, there's no equivalent in Spanish as there is no equivalent in English. We want to show people the quelites. This is what we should be eating. Yes, we hear about bok choy. Yes, we hear about broccoli and Brussels sprouts, which Dr. Esselstyn discussed. But those don't grow here. Those are not cultivated here. Spinach is grown, but spinach is something you buy in the market. Calitas is something you grow yourself. You have them in the backyard. They grow, they come up spontaneously. They seed themselves, people harvest them. This is how we should be responding to cardiovascular disease. Yes, it's good to know about bok choy and about Swiss charge and about spinach, but hey, we have our room, we have our calites. That's something we want to show in the garden. And it's not just about nutrition either, Jenna. We are harvest, harvesting rainwater. The garden has the largest rain-fed cistern in the state of Oaxaca. That's- Of course you do. Run. Yes, no, and I'm not, again, this is not- No, it's amazing because the water, water shortages problem. throughout Mexico have been a thing for quite some time and it's previewing exactly what's going to be happening in the next 20, 10 to 20 years and other places. Absolutely. So it's, it's about, to, we should all listen to what you're about to say about this because it's incredibly Absolutely. important. Absolutely, absolutely. And I have to say, uh, I need to add a little historical side note here, Jenna, if you allow me to. This was not planned. Originally, we were going to draw our water. This was Francisco's original idea and other people. We were going to clean sewage. That was the original plan. And in fact, part of the, of the initial investment went to paying an NGO that developed a project for an artificial swamp where the switch water was to be cleansed so that we could use it for watering the garden and for running the toilets. Unfortunately, that was going to be taking over half of the space almost, and it was going to be smelly. So it was consensus that's not going to work. Next option let's do a well. And we did the geophysics studies to see if groundwater could be used. And the geophysics study said, yes, you'll get plenty of water at that point. Turned out, no. We should have used one of those people who do the, the, the sticks, you know, because we probably would have gotten better advice from them. Anyway, we drilled, we invested in uh, building the, the hole, the, drilling the hole for the well, no water. So then we said, well, what are we gonna do? And we got a gift. This was a gift we have to thank. This was Diodoro Carrasco. We have to give credit to Diodoro. He was governor at the time and he provided the funds. This didn't come through the trust fund that Francisco had established. This came separately, a fund to build a cistern, 21 by 21 meters, almost four meter depth. We were able to store a million three hundred thousand liters. That's about four hundred thousand gallons of water from the rain, from the domes, and uh, from the roof of Santo Domingo. It drains to the garden, and we built a series of pipes to take the clean water 
to from the vaults of Santo Domingo to the cistern and we are able uh, to store water uh, when it rains this year is raining very well we're able to fill the cistern and we store water and we are able to irrigate the garden for four or five sometimes even more even longer months of the dry period because we have prolonged drought and it's not just the watering of the plants that need to be irrigated, but we use the water for the canals, which are a feature of our discourse. And we use the water for the greenhouse. And I will talk about the greenhouse in a moment. And we use the water for our facilities. We run the toilets and we wash our hands with water from our rain fed cistern. So number one, message for sustainability, water. Number two, we have solar panels. This building where I'm talking to you, the roof is covered with solar panels. We are generating, Jenna, more power than we use. I'm using electricity on my computer from the solar panels. We light our offices with electricity from the solar panels. We pump water for the garden with electricity we generate ourselves. And there's a surplus. We no longer pay a utility bill. And the surplus we produce goes to the network. The city benefits from the excess energy that we produce. So that's something we also want to convey to the public. We should be installing, all of us, generators to feed ourselves electricity. If we can do it, why not? homes though they have much smaller requirements of energy and finally our greenhouse jenna we're very proud about our greenhouse because it received the green architecture award in 2018. Uh, the garden got the uh, top 10 award the previous year from the canadian gardening council we're happy it wasn't for the united states i have to say under trump it was a Canadian prize and we're very proud of it. And then the following year, 2018, we got the Green Architecture Award specifically for the design of, and the, uh, beyond the design, the uh, ecological sustainability of the greenhouse we built. This is the work, the design. Is the original idea was, uh, again, Luis Zarati, he provided a sketch and that was the seed which a, a wonderful talented mexican architect based in chicago developed into the flourishing project that it is today he had the technical uh, and the, the technical capacity and the philosophy and the heart to really do a beautiful project that it is uh, his name is francisco gonzalez pulido He's a world-class architect. He's the one who designed the Bangkok airport. He designed the Tokyo post office. He designed the Fear Towers in uh, Las Vegas, the public library of the University of uh, Illinois, etc. He's a world-class architect and he designed this for us. And it's practically a gift. We're very thankful to him. And it's a two-chamber structure, one for tropical plants, which don't need to be cooled, and the other one for mountain plants for high altitude plants with requirement of a lot of moisture but cool temperatures and with a glass structure it gets like a steam house it's like a like a steam bath it gets very very warm in there so we're cooling it through geothermal cooling and we're innovators as far as we know nobody else is doing it in a botanical garden not only in mexico but apparently nobody else in latin america we're pumping air buried. We have a pipe that we put in. We put in the pipe as we built the foundations of the greenhouse. The, the foundations are very strong to withstand the heavy earthquakes that we have here. And along the foundations, we have this pipe that cools the air down. And the cool air comes out in the cool chamber. And this is how we should be cooling ourselves rather than investing in air conditioning that is so wasteful in energy and so expensive. This is the cheap way. This is the green way of cooling ourselves with global climate change. Let's cool ourselves. Let's cool ourselves the green way. We're 
we're presenting it to the public. We want to educate the public and we want them to feel it. Go inside the cool chamber, feel it yourself, feel the cool air coming out of the pipe. It's no air conditioning. It's no refrigerating compounds. It's just the air circulating berries. You can do that at your home. Of course you can do it. All you need is a fan to, to move the air. So the garden, the garden isn't just about the past. Jenna, the garden is about the future. That's how we envision it with Francisco. Doesn't it make sense to have like a larger space for the garden outside of the city? There's, you know, I, I'm envisioning like a science campus outside of Oaxaca City. That's a beautiful idea, a science campus. UNAM is starting a campus, by the way, in what used to be the military zone. And that's a beautiful project. And we are in not only involved in it, but, but rooting for it. Uh, that's work, work in process. Again, it has been slowed because of the pandemic, but uh, UNAM is gaining presence in Mexico. And I'm very happy to share with you that we have opened up space here at the garden for three branches of UNAM. We have an office and research center of the, the Institute of Geography. We have also the office for the Institute of Historical Research and most recently, Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas, which is um, philology, uh, historical linguistics, but uh, based on written documents. All three institutions very active, all three very germane to our work. So we're very happy and we're hoping that the next institution we can host is the Institute of Biology. That would really be wonderful if we can invite them here, if, if we can maneuver things with the state government to open up a space for them. The expansion beyond the walls of Santo Domingo is something that again we envision with Francisco since, since the very beginning. He had the hope and he really tried to negotiate the, the maneuvers with a neighboring community, San Agustin Etla. Did you visit San Agustin Etla in China? You have to, next time you, have, next time you come, you have to, because that is Francisco's legacy just as strongly as Santo Domingo. There's a textile, former textile mill in San Agustin Etla that oversees a beautiful town. It's a town that is blessed with the biggest supply of water in the entire Valley of Oaxaca. And they have a whole watershed that they own. And it's beautiful, it's covered with forest. The tree of the little hands, which is one of the glories of the flora of Mexico, grows there. It's the most inland population of that species, which is the icon of the Mexican botanists. I mean, it's mini paradise, okay? You have to visit it. The former textile mill, Francisco, managed to convert into the most lively center for the arts in Mexico, but arts with a capital A and a capital G, green arts. He envisioned a place where people could practice and teach graphic design, photography, textile art, all kinds of artistic expression, but sustainable. Sustainable energy-wise, sustainable water-wise, and zero pollution. Because you may know that photography and graphic design in the traditional techniques were horrible. In fact, sadly, we fear that what brought about Francisco's demise was his lifelong exposure to these organic solvents used in uh, the graphic arts, which are carcinogenic. Anyway, he was staunchly devoted to establishing a center where people could practice and learn alternative ways of producing an engraving, of producing a photograph, of producing a piece of jewelry, of producing a dyed fi fibers, a tapestry, with zero pollution and with sustainable energy and with wise use of water, non-wasteful. And he succeeded. Centro de las Artes de San Agustín Etla, the acronym of CASA, CASA, home, 
Casa is the showplace for sustainable art. And he envisioned an extension of our garden right there. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened for various conflicts, for various struggles that involve local politics, but also the lack of vision of people who could be funding us. It hasn't happened. It may happen in the future, we hope. But what I can report is that we now have an extension, Jena, in a place you may not have visited, which is Las Canteras. Las Canteras is the navel for the city in the sense that it's the quarry where the green stone came from to build the city of Oaxaca. The first phase of the city was not built with a green stone. The first phase of the city, which you can see in San Pablo, you can see in the textile museum, used a different kind of stone, a harder stone, in fact, Piedra Laja. But uh, they realized uh, later on that there's this quarry very close by and it's easier stone to work with and it's a beautiful green color. So they stop using the Piedra Laja and they start using Cantera Verde and the city is built out of Cantera Verde. In fact, it's an emblem of the city, the green stone. And that quarry that yielded the building material to build the city now lodges the memory of the city. It's a beautiful figure of speech because now in that it became a city park. It used to be a, a, a vacant, huge vacant lot. It used to be where the city threw the garbage, you know. The old holes where the greenstone had been extracted it became filled in with dump, with a dump, of, a rubbish dump, you know. But that was cleaned out uh, over 20 years ago and became a city park. But it was not very active, not uh, loved by the local neighbors, but it, it had potential for more. And both Francisco and especially Marisabel and Alfredo Harp, Marisabel Grenier and Alfredo Harp envisioned building there a um, new pole of cultural development for the city beyond the limits of the historical uh, city. And it's become another success story. It's a beautiful building designed uh, by Ignacio uh, Mendaro Corsini. Uh, it's a brand new building. In this case, it's no restoration of anything historical. It's a concrete building, but beautifully colored, beautifully designed with an interplay with light that is just stunning. It now houses all the historical archives, all the historical documents, indigenous manuscripts, and all our historical memory in the place that gave birth to the city, the place that provided the greenstone for building the city as we see it today. And the green spaces surrounding that initial building, but also the convention center, another building designed by Ignacio Mendaro to hold a Congress, convention, conferences, a big complex. Those green spaces are now under our responsibility. So that's where the garden is expanding. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful because we have lots of space there. We have water because the gaps in the stone where the quarry was worked, they now are filled with water, rainwater that collects there, and we can use the water for irrigation. Uh, there's potential there. We're starting to work there. Giovanni, whom you met, is in charge of that project. He goes there every day. And it's really good to have a space where we can send plants that we have propagated here, we can send them over there. We are collecting new plants. We are developing the theme since we have the historical memory right there. We're developing the theme of the plants that provide fiber for the paper, of plants that provide ink, the plants that are related to memory, the long-term memory especially. And we have made a case for having a collection of cycads there. Cycads are very interesting plants, as you know, because they harken back hundreds of millions of years. We have cycad fossils from the time of the earliest dinosaurs, over 250 million years ago, 
seconds were already a distinct lineage. And here's a nifty bit of information, Jenna. Oaxaca boasts the highest psychic diversity in the world for a region of its size. We have three genera of cycads, and two of them have their center of diversity right here. The genus Dion, which spreads north as far as Sonora and Nuevo León, and spreads south as far as Honduras. But here is where we have the greatest species diversity, and several of the species are exclusively Oaxacan of that genus, Dion. Dion occurs in both the wet and dry areas, and most interesting are the dry areas where we, you have Dion. And then the second genus is Ceratosamia. Ceratosamia has again its center of diversity right here. Again, several species of Ceratosamia uniquely Oaxacan, endemic to Oaxaca. And in this case, Ceratosamia is of wet areas, both cloud forests and tropical uh, rainforests. And then we also have some species of Zamia, but Zamia is more widespread, it's not, doesn't have its center of distribution here. But the fact that we have two genera of cycads having their greatest diversity here, I think speaks for itself. It's not, it's not difficult to call you uh, someone who is uh, proud of Oaxaca, right? <laughs> absolutely not, absolutely not. I mean, it's quite, it's quite obvious, quite apparent. <laughs> I hope you'll show Jenna the photo of my grandmother eh, as an actress in a theater play where she impersonated an indigenous princess, Ita Ndewi, which means in the mystic, in the Highland mystic language, the, the, fly, the, the flower of the sky or the flower of heaven. And she was very proud of that. And this happened before the revolution of 1910. This is before Mexico gained conscious as a society of the importance of our indigenous past. My grandmother was part of a movement here in Oaxaca long before the revolution it changed our outlook on our own past. She was in person in an indigenous princess and she was proud of it. And her father spoke Zapotec. I'm very proud of that fact. Emiliano, her father, unfortunately I don't have a picture of him to share with you. He spoke Zapotec. So we have an indigenous background in our family. I'm sending you a gigantic hug through Thank this. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for this. I am so excited for everyone to hear from you, really, um, you. especially people from Oaxaca. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah, for real. Thank you. I have to finish by saying never before have I felt like I feel talking to you. It's sincere. Let's do it again very soon. Sí. Hasta la próxima. Thanks so much for watching Down to Earth. Please like and subscribe, share it, or watch the show on YouTube and listen to it on Spotify, Apple, and Stitcher. I'll see you next week.